sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the BCSN's 2021 Black College Baseball Media Roundup as ranked by Black College Nines. I would like to introduce you to A.D. Drew and Michael Coker. Good morning, gentlemen. Hello, Roy. Morning, morning fellas. So how's it going, guys? going okay it's a great day we know a lot of people are still snowed in or iced in or still without power throughout most of the country there michael but uh we just hope that we you know the the sounds of summer coming a little bit early with baseball hbcu baseball can help bring some cheer and brighten up uh, a lot of people's day as we are getting ready to get into hbcu baseball season Yes, sir. And I, I pray for the safety of everyone involved in these this Arctic freeze we're experiencing, especially in Texas, where it's unusual to hear that they received snow, let enough weather that's forcing everybody to lose power and have the struggle. Uh, I ask that they may di diligent with God, keep God in, in their prayers and thoughts. Yeah. Uh, Michael, uh before we get started and get and get, go through the top 10, why don't you kind of tell everybody about Black College Nines, uh, what you guys do and how the polls came about. Okay, Black College Nines, we cover a strictly historically black college and university baseball. We, our main goal is to promote the sport, to get Black College Nines is we preserve the legacy of historically black college and university baseball. That's our goal. Our goal is to be the forefront in leading the nation in getting what our coaches do, put the product on the field. And that's our, like I said, that's our main goal. That's the, the reason why we push the sport to great heights. That is one of the reasons why we look forward to presenting Black college baseball to the, the uh, world. It is one of the best things that I like about uh, what we're doing is it gives us a chance to educate and inform the historical history and the historical aspect of HBCUs. All right. And hey, Michael, uh, if, if you would quickly go down the lineup today, go, th go through the top 10 and uh, the head coach and little 20, 30 second nugget about each team as, as you go through those. Well, I want to welcome everyone to uh, Black College Nines, our uh, 2021 preseason poll. Our poll consists of uh, our voting committee is made up of an informal and impartial group of individuals who follow college baseball at all levels. It includes HBCU in, in, group of athletic administrators and educators, college baseball writers, and other sports journalists and broadcasters, former HBCU uh, and other college baseball players, above all else, 
college enthusiasts who have an interest in promoting HBCU baseball and getting it to the forefront. Our, po our poll, our voters are voted upon, they're independent of anything that we go to do. When we vote, we have more than 40 members of the media from across the nation who come together on the days that we decide that we're gonna have our poll. And that includes preseason and the regular season that will lead up to a national champion. Coming into the 2021 season, this is how our poll turns out. All From right, the large school division. Go ahead. From the large school division, coming in at number 10, led by Antoine Riggins, is the Prairie View A&M. Prairie View A&M last season, uh, because of, I believe, COVID shut them down. I believe that they were going to be the surprise team of, of 2020. Uh, the, all indications were they were on a breakout season until the pandemic hit. Coming in at number nine, led by Brett Richardson, the Alcorn State team. Alcorn State was another team that, from the SWAC that should have had a good season because COVID shut them down again. And it's 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 unfortunate that we had a, a pandemic that not only affected the entire country, but it it's still affecting the world. Our number eight team is led by Jim Corner from the uh, University of North Carolina Central, another MEAC school. Coming in at number seven from the Sunshine State, coached by Jamie Shope. Florida A&M University. The Rattlers, who were known to start off with a strong season at the beginning of the season, and this is something that they've been doing for the last five, six years. The Rattlers, Florida A&M at number seven. The number six team is led by Coach James Cooper from Grambling State University. The Tigers of Grambling State is the number six ranked team in our top 10 preseason poll. Number five is led by new head coach, Chris Crenshaw, who was just hired recently to replace the former coach, Garrett Jackson. Uh, Southern University, though S Southern University is the, the Jaguars from Southern University is your number five ranked team. Before I move on to the uh, fourth ranked team, um, as I said, Black College Nines, we have more than 40 poll voters. We vote independent. We do not discuss our polling to each other. And it's an honor that when we first took this endeavor on, we started with six and we wanted to be more transparent and we have grown to it, more than 40 voters across the nations who are more than enthusiastic to be a part of this. Returning to our top 10 poll to round out the remaining poll, coming in at number four is Michael Robertson led Texas Southern University. Now Texas Southern and Michael Robertson is a, to me, in my eyes, he is a coach. He is a second half coach. Uh, he turns his team around during the second half of each season and he shocks and surprises people especially in the SWAC conference. At number four, it's Texas Southern. Number three is North Carolina A&T University led by Ben Hill. North Carolina A&T is one of your better programs in the MEAC conference. This year, they have a stout team, senior driven. Uh, big things are expected out of uh, North Carolina A&T. That's our number thir third ranked team in the nation. Number two is Jackson State University, led by Omar Johnson. Omar Johnson is going into his, this will be his 13th season, where the past 12, he has won 30 or more ball games straight, which is a record for an HBCU, 30 ball games. 
coming into our poll at the number one ranked team across the nation is Alabama State University, which is led by Jose Vasquez. Jose was brought in as a head coach as he was part of uh, Mel Melendez's uh, assistant from Bethune who built powerhouses. Ever since he's taken over, he has built and he's carrying Alabama State into another powerhouse. Our number one ranked team for the preseason of 2021 is Alabama State. And there you have our top 10 teams uh, coming into this season, which is, will be an exciting season because we're coming off of COVID and teams are getting, are getting back to playing. And with the season starting this weekend, uh, opening uh, uh, play starts uh, February 19th. All these teams will be in action, including the Andre Dawson Major League Baseball Classic, which will be played in New Orleans. All right, Michael, before we get into our first guest, uh, Coach Antoine Riggins of uh, Prairie View a and if you would, could you go over a couple of teams that are just on the outside looking in who may be teams that people need to watch out for to jump into the top 10 or may even ultimately wind up in the top five in the uh, Black College Nines polls this year? Well, you have several teams, and I have several bubble teams um, that I would like to – uh, include as, as well. But I'm going to stick with uh, our polling on these teams and, and give everybody a breakdown of uh, the, the few teams that are on the bubble that could have been in, in, in the ninth and tenth spot. Uh, one of those teams is uh, This is the dean of the College of HBCU. Dake has a, a uh, excellent ball club uh, they one of their hitters uh, is is an, an, a national hitter. Although his numbers weren't there for 2020, um, he is in the top uh, 100 as far as uh, the NCAA and D1 baseball and Baseball America. And that's Norfolk State. A team that uh, should get some um, good consideration is an Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, Carlos James, uh, he's got pitching this year. Uh, he took some time to address the issues that was needed to bring his, his team back uh, into the forefront of the SWAC baseball, and that's uh, Arkansas uh, Pine Bluff. And then there's Coppin State. Uh, I expect some good things out of Coppin State this year. I think that Coppin State is uh, an excellent ball club. But also, I have uh, a dark horse, and I think that dark horse is Delaware State. I think Delaware State went out and addressed some of their issues of uh, the, for their roster. I think that Delaware State has uh, proven that they're ready to go to the next level in uh, uh, from coming out of fall ball, and I think I think that they're going to make some noise. So those are my uh, uh, teams that were voted upon and receive votes in our, our, our top 10 poll. So these aren't any teams that are just being thrown out there. They were actually voted upon by our more than 40 plus members. All right, coach. Uh, it's about time for us to bring on our number 10 team and coach Antoine Riggins of Prairie View A&M. Uh, Michael, go ahead and... Uh, Get, tell us a little bit about uh, Prairie View A&M, and then we'll switch it over to Coach Riggins to give us his opening statement before we get into the question and answer portion. Coach, how are you? Coach? I say I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm sorry. All righty. Coach, uh, I want to I wanna jump right in and, and say some things that uh, I noticed last year. And I believe you had a breakout year last year. You know, your, your record indicates that. You had some good wins. Uh, what was disturbing to me was COVID, like I said. But you had a, a, a ball club. Every game you were in, you were matching with hits, 
when you took on a few top teams, you matched them with hits. You may have lost those ball games, but that's something that, and I think it got started in the 2019 uh, conference championship where you guys went in there with emotion and you came out ahead for 2020. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, first and foremost, um, no, um, every year we, we, uh, we focus on on getting the job done, getting the, uh, the job done, um, the task done, uh, whatever it takes to to compete. Um, and hitting is, you know, if you don't hit, you don't have an opportunity to hit, you're not going to win. Um, I know pitching and defense win games, um, but you also have to score runs. Um, you know, we've been putting it together for the past uh, two or three years um, as far as, as hitting. Um, but I, I can... I feel real good about this year. Um, we had a, a very successful fall. Um, and um, before the weather moved in, we was having a, a very successful spring. So um, I'm looking forward to the, the beginning of the season and, um, and you know, hope that the weather holds up and so we can get started this weekend. Now, coming into the season, your, uh, your, your, your first game, your, your, your play Friday, you're on the road. Uh, what can we expect? Our, oh, our first game, your first game. Oh, our first game. Uh, we're playing against Alabama State, which is, is you know, it's, it's always a, a good team, a good competitive team. Um, so I, I expect it to be a dogfight. Um, I expect that you know both teams to go out here, play play defense and pitch. Um, so uh, looking forward to it. Um, and uh, like I said, man, it's, it's going to be a dogfight. It's 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 a it's, it's always good to go against one of the best teams on the other side, um, especially early in the year. So um, we'll have a, 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 a scout report and, and everything for for us to have, um, you know, for us uh, visually to have instead of taking someone else's scout report for the um, for the championships, for the SWAC championship. So it's always good to face those guys early in the season. Michael, I'm going to jump in here really quick and just let any of our media members who are in, if you have a question for Coach, please just type it in the chat box that you have a question. We will then release your microphone and allow you to bring your camera on. So. Well, Coach, how has the pandemic affected your players? Has there been a change in their attitude? Has there been a change in the things that they're doing besides – uh, going to class online, uh, it, it have totally. Um, and I think it benefits us as as a program. Um, coming in and, and not knowing what this this uh, this disease or, or or virus can can do to you or or your parents or your grandparents. Um, a lot of guys, um, you know, saw that you know last year that you know that they the one sport that they love could be taken away from. And, you know, and everybody came in focused. They have done everything that they're supposed to do. We have stayed safe up to up to this point. Um, we didn't have, you know, one or two um, positive tests, but um, it have got them closer um, to, to together um, with the with the new guys coming in as well. So I, I think that with this, you know, with this pandemic being um, so bad, we had some good come out of. So looking forward to it. Well, let's 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 winding this down. Let's talk about uh, uh, the SWAC. To me, the SWAC is is a tough conference. Uh, scheduling wise, your conference, you take on the big guys. There's no doubt about that for HBCUs coming into this season. Uh, how are you guys going to play when you when you play the the uh, the big RPI driven uh, uh, top 10 teams that are ranked across the nation? Oh, we play them just like it in, like any other game. You're going in those games to win. Um, you know, it, it just depends on, on what you get that day. Uh, you know that in, in baseball that any given day, anybody can be beat. Um, so I go into every game um, knowing that I can win that game. It just depends on how we pitch and, and, and play defense and hit. So, um, every year since I've been here, we've been playing some of the top teams in the country, uh, in SEC, uh, Big 12. Um, you know, it, it really doesn't matter to me. 
as long as we're able to put nine guys out there and compete every day, then I think I have a chance to win. So, all right, uh, coach, uh, got one question for you. Then, uh, Doctor Kenyatta Kavir will come in behind behind my question. Uh, obviously, scheduling has been the big thing uh, right now with uh, with the, with a lot of HBCUs. You know, travel restrictions and everything like that. Uh, first of all, I talked about how the pandemic has affected your travel because we know you you travel a lot further right now. You you basically don't leave the Texas or Louisiana except for your one conference game or one set of conference games in uh in Arkansas. Number one, talk about that. Then number two, talk about the you're jumping right into it. You've got three SWAC opponents in the Andre Dawson Classic. Are those conference games or all those non-conference? conference games, if you understand what I'm saying, against conference opponents. Uh, kind of talk about that. Um, first question again? I'm sorry, man. It's 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 been tough. I'm, <laughs> I'm working on two hours of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. We understand. Yeah. How, how has uh, the pandemic affect your scheduling this year compared to what you, uh, what you would normally do in a normal year? Because, like I say, all your games pretty much are Texas, Louisiana, and then you then you white time when you uh, go into uh, Arkansas for a conference game. Yeah, the, the pandemic have, have affected me um, pretty bad, man. Um, we had a couple games. We had a serious game with New Mexico State that we had to that they had to cancel. Um, three or four Southland schools had to cancel. Um, so a normal schedule, we will play you know 54, 56 games. I'd be surprised if we were able to get forty five. You know. Um, do with the, the pandemic and now with the weather, um, we may be trying to look for for uh, opening uh, for this weekend real fast if if uh, the Andre Dawson get uh, get canceled. So uh, the pandemic has had affected our schedule big time. And do those games uh, you've you've got scheduled Alabama State, Alabama A and M, uh, and Jackson State. Do those games count as conference games or are those uh, just conference opponents that you just happen to be playing? No, they don't count as conference game. We just happen to be playing uh, conference opponents, um, so it's 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 good. It's good for the conference. Um, I think that you know, um, in the future, I think it, I think it'd be better if we play everybody from from each side. Um, but with the new two uh, the two new teams coming in, um, that'll be tough, especially with travel and um, traveling to Florida uh, twice a year. So um, I think they're going to stick with the both sides, um, the east and the west. And uh, we'll face them in a, in a tournament. All right. Uh, coming up with the next question will be uh, Dr. Kenyatta Kavir of uh, Dr. Kavir's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Uh, yes, Coach Riggins. Hope hey, all is well. Hey, it's good to see you. Great smile there. I know you're putting in a lot of work. I hope you and your family are safe. Obviously, you're right in the heart of it in Texas. And uh, we're seeing uh, that dilemma. I'm here as well. And so I really hope uh, things are working out for your family. I imagine with two hours of sleep that you're trying to make sure everybody's uh, warm and, and take care of not only the team, but your responsibilities at home. So uh, prayers up for all involved and stay appreciate strong. It. Appreciate the work that you're doing. Appreciate it. With that said, um, I want to play it forward a little bit. I know coaching wise, you're always focused on the moment. And it's a great place to be, but uh, you also have to foreshadow and be strategic in moving forward. This is kind of a piggyback on AD. Uh, I really like the way that you wrote, that, uh, wrote down what is going to take place this season and how you're looking forward to that. Uh, if you would, in terms of foreshadowing a little bit, what, it, what are your expectations in terms of the expansion of the conference with Bethune-Cookman and FAMU? What does that do for the overall landscape of baseball and the SWAC? And specifically, um, what does that do for baseball with Prairie View? Texas Southern, if you would, in terms of the state of Texas, bringing in another state that is significant in playing the game of baseball. Mm, wow. Um, first and foremost, my expectation um, this year, just like any other year, is to go out and compete and compete for a championship. Um, you know, that that won't change uh, as long as I'm here at Prairie View. Um, but as far as the, the two new schools coming in uh, for our conference, I think it's huge for our conference. Um, not only is it huge, I think it's going to give us a little bit more marketing um, to get get a chance to see our guys uh, um, 
you know, on TV or, or screaming or uh, whatever it takes for, you know, um, to, 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 um, to bury the conference, I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. I, I think these two teams that we got coming in are very uh, good teams. I think um, they're going to, you know, they, I, me personally, I think they're going to make the, um, the uh, east side a little bit tougher than it have been in the past. Uh, you know, so uh, this, with Alcorn moving over, it's going to make it tough on our side as well. Um, you know, we always say that the west side is the tough side. So uh, I'm looking forward to these guys coming in. Um, I'm looking for the, uh, the challenge. Um, and I think it's just, it's good for baseball. It's good for the swag. Um, it's just, you know, overall, man, I'm excited about it. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, that's, that's 2022. So, uh, we got to get through this season and then we'll be, uh, we look forward to that. All right. Thank you, coach. Well done. All right, no problem. All right, Dr. Gaville, thank you for your question. Is there anyone else that has a question that they would like to ask coach Riggins? Please type it in the chat box. And with that, seeing to, it looks like we got AD Drew wanting to pop back in here. Doc, thank you for your time. Uh, no, Coach, all I was going to say, you got any, any final thoughts you want to get out to, uh, to uh, Panther Nation before we move on to our next guest? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for having me. Um, I think this is a great platform for us, um, uh, for, for, for the conference, for Black College Baseball. I appreciate that. I appreciate everything you guys do. Um, for Panther Nations, hey, get your popcorn ready. We ready, <laughs> ready to roll. <laughs> We're going to need popcorn and a, and a hoodie this weekend, though. It looks <laughs> <great>. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. We, we, th we thank you for your time, Coach. I appreciate you guys. Y'all take y'all take care and be safe, okay? All right. Well, Coach, hold on before you leave. Hold on. Yes, Michael, sir. go ahead and come back in. Well, I want to say to you, Coach Riggins, uh, it's not about what Black College 9 does. It's not about what uh, 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 the Black Networks do. It's all about you and the product that you put on the field. You put it on the field, and we will continue to report it. I appreciate that. I appreciate that more than you, th more than you know. God bless you, Coach. Hey, God bless you, too. Y'all guys be safe. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right, okay. Michael. And, gentlemen, uh, at this point, we are waiting for Coach Bretton Richardson from Alcorn State. I'm not sure if this is who we have. I'm trying to reach out to the person that is in the room as Franchise One <laughs> to see if that is him. No. Uh, that's going to be there. Oh, that's Carlos Brown. Okay, so we're we're waiting for Coach Richardson to come in at this point. Um, why don't you guys talk a little bit about? While we do that, uh, Roy, I was going to say, uh, got Michael Coker. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Doctor Cavill if he would like to come back on the, on the screen for for a brief discussion. Is he still, Doc still around? Still around. I, I guess. Yes, I'm here. All right. Uh, would, would you want to? Would you mind coming back on for a minute? Yes, I'm available. All right. So, uh, so I'm I'm going to ask Doctor Cavill. You know, Doctor Cavill is swag through and through. Although he covers uh, baseball, where he covers black college sports throughout the, throughout the landscape. Dr. Cavill, from a person who lives in the SWAC area, just kind of talk how you feel about SWAC baseball down there, what the impact of SWAC baseball is in that part of the country. There's a couple of ways to look at that, and I really appreciate that question in so many, day, uh, so many ways. Um, when you talk about Black College Nines and before that you had Black College Baseball, that really did a great job in terms of providing an additional platform. Quietly down here, which is one of the things uh, that uh, is intriguing, baseball has been a hotbed in the South for a long time, particularly in the state of Texas. Baseball is huge. Um, it's, it's big. It's played year-round in many different ways. Um, it's played at the uh, lowest level, starting with t-ball, 
you baseball, all the various ways that you play baseball um, prior to college. Over the last couple of years, you have seen baseball kind of go in a different direction once you get to the high school level, um, which has been a little troubling for those that follow baseball. But I say all that to give you a ground level framework of just baseball and the SWAC, particularly in the state of Texas. Uh, but baseball has been always big. Some people would say quietly around here that baseball is, is the second biggest sport behind football. And that will surprise people on the Atlantic and East Coast uh, when they think basketball and may think basketball first even before football. Um, and you have some powerful schools in the SWAC that have played basketball very strong over the years. Uh, but baseball gets fans out. Um, and uh, Michael Copeland is going to share this with you. When you get some of the fans in uh, the SWAC talking trash about baseball, oh, it can be extremely entertaining. I mean, you have the famous um, framework of Grambling with the gentleman that used to be on the top of the stands that had the boot and would throw the boot on the field and in the fans and really get into it and folks would get lathered up. And that's not even going down south in terms of uh, Baton Rouge coming over that hill and getting to the sticks, man, you knew you were into some uh, um, baseball. And then you got the intriguing part about Texas Southern. It plays in a city park. So you literally have everybody <laughs> in the city that will come by, music blasting, ice cream trucks, fans back and forth, short porch field. Can you hit the ball into the tennis courts? Uh, so in a lot of ways, it's just fascinating when you think about it. And then you go back a little further west, farthest part that you can go in the swag the prayer of you and you come to the hills uh over there at prayer view in that playing field and it gets really exciting now the thing that you also have seen in the swag how you have upgraded the facilities around the conference which really made it fascinating and you start to shift off and go in the east where you're going to those east divisions and you've seen historically what uh, jackson state has done with baseball Auckland state is right there in so many different ways and then you had the uptick of Alabama State in regards to their assurgence in terms of being a championship-level team in a play. And now you see Alabama A&M in a lot of ways pushing that new direction. Um, and so the SWAC has just been fascinating from a historical standpoint, has always held its own, had a chance to send people to the Major League Baseball that folks have been a fan for so many years. And now, as we start to talk about expansion, um, Bethune Cookman and FAMU, which are two very solid programs, obviously. Bethune Cookman has been a perennial uh, winner in terms of the MIAC, and just recently, MIAC, I mean, this FAMU has reasserted as well. And you add those power brokers to a conference that is historically rich, solidly rich, and pushing the envelope in terms of what they can do to get better. So hopefully, that gives you a little framework in terms of Southwestern athletic conference and what it means for baseball in that part of the country and in particular in terms of the SWAC. And right now we are awaiting coach uh, Bretton Richardson of Alcorn State to come on the uh, to come on as our, as our next guest. So I'm going to uh, ask a question to Michael Coker. Michael, we all know how competitive SWAC baseball is among HBCUs. But the question everyone always asks is, what happens when we go play the HWCUs, historically white colleges and universities? If you would, Michael, just kind of enlighten everybody about how competitive SWAC baseball is when it comes to playing non-HBCUs. Well, if you look at the schedule, and this is not a knock on the MEAC teams in the MEAC. But if you look at the schedule, and each uh, team that schedule is ranked teams across the board in the SWAC, they're constantly taking on year after year these heavy ranked teams from uh, the, the top conferences, like the, the, the this, uh, SEC. And you look at the, the, the RPIs of these teams that uh, the SWAC is playing. Uh, some people have said to me, it's a regional thing. No. A lot of 
what the SWAC does to elevate its program, to make its program better for once they get into the heavy conference play, they're taking on these uh, number five ranked teams like Texas Tech, like uh, Mississippi State, uh, uh, Auburn. Uh, the, and the list keeps growing and growing. Uh, as an example, uh, Southern, LSU. These teams are, are con constantly ranked and they have budgets that are just will blow your mind and when you play these teams and when you see a, a SWAT team playing a, a a top team that's ranked in the top 10 the top 15 it, it prepares them for the season like I said it's not a knack on the MEAC but I look at the SWAC as being an overall baseball conference because you have hitting you have pitching Although personally, I feel that the MEAC is more of a arms race. Uh, they have a lot of good pitching. I don't think, in comparison to the hitters, uh, it's 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 the same. It's different. I mean, year after year, I'm a stats guy, and stats don't lie. And stats have proven time and time again the excitement that comes out of the SWAC uh, hitting the overall play. Uh, and like, I'm not trying to, like I said, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing the MEAC, but a fact of, is, is a fact. I, I look at uh, every year, I look at what the players do versus uh, conference, non-conference, common opponents, and ranked opponents. And time and time again, I'm seeing that the SWAC teams, the SWAC players and the SWAC coaches, they do a good job of winning games. If they're not winning, they put a good product on the field. Now, the national media is not fair, and I need to put this out there. You take Mississippi Valley State, the only time the national media really comes on board is when if uh, uh, Mississippi Valley is, is losing by 20, 25 runs, and then they have a 1,000 comments. They're making all of these comments. But when you have a Southern who beats LSU every year out of the two games they play or three games they play, you you, you, you don't get the national media uh, reporting this. You don't get the national media reporting when Texas Southern knocked off a number six ranked Mississippi State last year. You don't get these when Southern beats LSU. You don't get these when Grambling beats the top ranked teams. All you're getting is it's coming from a region and they're saying it's a regional thing. No. With the addition of Bethune Cookman, who was a powerhouse at one point, and Florida AM, who was led by their head coach, Jamie Shopes, who came in from Florida State, they're just going to change the landscape and elevate the swag. It's and it's doing this. It's it's happening already. It's you look at. We just got finished talking to uh, Coach Wiggins from Peer Review. This has got given a spike in recruiting. It has opened the floodgates because, like Texas, Florida is a hotbed of baseball talent. Besides football, there's two sports that they play down here heavy. Football is one, and baseball is second. And shockingly enough, baseball is your number one sport in the state of Florida, although football is more in the southern region of where I live in the South Florida area. Baseball is throughout the entire state. So I've said this for years, and I'm going to continue to say it, that the play on the field in the SWAT conference is an overall. I like the hitting. I like the pitching. Uh I think that our teams can get over that hump of being uh, under 500 against these ranked teams. But you have to understand that and those ranked teams, they throw their best players against HBCUs. Nobody wants to be beaten by an HBCU. So if, if uh, one of these ranked teams has a guy that's throwing 98, you better believe going into a weekend series, or even a midweek game, they're going to throw their best player. 
All right. I'll tell you guys what we're going to do. And for all those who are tuning in with us uh, live on Facebook, YouTube, uh, blackcollege9s.com, and on mybcsn.net, we are going to take a quick break. And then we will bring in Coach Jim, uh, Coach Jim Corner of North Carolina Central University. You're watching the large school HBCU baseball roundup. We'll be back in just a moment. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU diaspora, as well as the upcoming week of HBCU sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watts and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. It was a, a monumental game for a and and Tampa. It was a monumental game. Somebody had to lose, and thank God it was them this time. We knew it was going to be a battle. Look at Jake Ava's record. 202 and 36, I think. Some, some un, off the wall figures. And nobody would play him because they didn't want to take a chance of getting beat. But the truth of it is, over 46,000 tickets. Blacks were sitting on in, in the East stands, whites were sitting in the West stands, and the score wound up 34-28. Uh, the only thing we proved that uh, we weren't inferior, that we were not inferior, and we were not a friend. For one night, for 160 minutes, we were better than them. This is Brian Fulford, A.D. Drew and I. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the BCSN 2021 Black College Baseball Media Roundup. Um, Unfortunately, we did not get our number nine team or coach, uh, Brenton Richardson of Alcorn, was not able to join us. But coming up now, we have the head coach of the North Carolina Central Eagles, Jim Kerner. And I will now turn it back over to Michael Coker and Coach Kerner. Coach Kerner, Mike Coker here with Black College Nines. How are you? Good, Mike. How you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself? How are things coming? We're doing okay. Getting ready to play this weekend against Army and looking forward to starting up. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, in our top 10 poll, you were, you're ranked number eight. Coming into the season, there are many factors that have forced you to make changes to your program, make changes to the way you think, how your athletic program uh conducts its daily business, and I'm talking about the pandemic. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm jumping in on the pandemic because this is this is really shut down. It has really changed our thoughts, our thought process, and how we go about conducting what should have been a normal fall ball leading into the season. How are things coming with the program and uh, you and your players? Well, the pandemic certainly caused a lot of challenges and, you know, it's going to be something throughout the season that we're going to have to continue to monitor. But, you know, the fall, we, we had to be, you know, we had to take extra precautions as far as our testing goes and, and, and distancing and, and mask wearing. And our guys did a really good job in the fall. We, we, we really limited any any major, uh, you know, setbacks and, and that type of thing. We, we did have a little bit of a setback this spring coming out of uh, the uh, holiday break where, you know, we really couldn't get on the field until about a week and a half ago. So, you know, where we got a little bit of a late start this uh, this spring, but guys are working hard and to catch up and to get ready to go for opening weekend. Well, tell me, Coach, on the recruiting stage, how has the pandemic changed your thoughts, your process on – going out and getting uh, these top recruits to come into your program. As an example, uh, the NCAA has granted seniors, well, all players, an additional year of eligibility. And that, from across the board, is causing uh, 
people are saying it's causing problems with uh, recruiting a, f a freshman. How has this changed the, the uh, outlook for the Eagles? Well, you, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be recruiting as many as you normally would. I think the, the biggest thing for us was to get a handle um, on the guys that would have returned next year um, that, uh, you know, we're going to use that extra year and then go ahead and try to plan from there as far as the type of and number of players you wanted to bring in uh, for the next season. So for us, it was first getting a handle on who was planning on using that extra year and then recruiting accordingly. Now, for us, we, we had to do a lot of streaming. We watched a lot of games online. We, we, you know, obviously a lot of phone calls, but we did a lot of Zoom recruiting meetings with our recruits where we were able to get the whole coaching staff on the calls and, you know, go through a whole presentation with video and our player development program and our academic uh, support system to really give the players the best view of North Carolina Central that they could get. Well, Coach, one of the things that I would want to discuss with you is the administration made a decision to cancel uh, North Carolina Central's uh, program. And it was a shocker to not just many in the HBCU ranks, but across the nation as well. You, North Carolina Central has a very fine baseball program. You're, you play in a very nice uh, stadium. You play in a good region in across uh, the eastern seaboard. So how has this changed knowing that we're just a week out from this information and what brought this on? Well, it, it obviously has been extremely difficult. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it's hard on the players. It's hard on the coaches. I believe our guys have handled this extremely well. Uh, I believe our players are extremely motivated and focused to, to making sure this is going to be a, a great season. You know, a lot of hard work was was put into preparation and, you know, we're going to see it through. Um, you know, I guess in short, you can you can blame the, the pandemic. Uh, I guess, you know, that's that's probably where, you know, the biggest uh, impact came from the economics of the pandemic and the struggles that most universities are going through and, and um, just the, the financial aspect that um, the pandemic has caused some economic hardships. And unfortunately, you know, we were, we were a casualty of that. Coach, how you doing today? Uh, AD Drew here from Black College Sports Network. How you doing? All right. Uh, I wanted to ask you kind of a follow-up on the question that Michael just asked you. Uh, obviously, BAC baseball after 2021 is over as we have known it for so many years. Uh, that due to teams leaving the conference, uh, you guys dropping your program, and, and other factors. So with this being the last year of uh, BAC baseball as we know it, especially for your student-athletes there, how do you motivate these kids to go out and still compete for a championship versus just going through the motions and putting themselves in position to for those who have eligibility where everybody will have the opportunity with eligibility remaining to go on to another university to, to continue their career? Sure. Well, I think it's a multifaceted answer. And, and to me, it, it comes down to pride. It, it comes down to individual character you, these players in my opinion uh, they owe it to themselves that they, they've put in a lot of hard work uh, just because the program isn't um, isn't going to be around next year to me it, it doesn't negate the work that they put into this year and first and foremost I believe these student athletes owe it to themselves and, and to their families that put them in this position to go out there and, and compete and to play hard, but they also owe it to the people that came before them. There, there was, there has been a lot of student athletes in, in my ten years here in North Carolina Central that also put in a lot of hard work and effort to get this program started and and to get it to the point that it is now. And I believe very strongly they owe it to their their predecessors to go out there and 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 play with play hard for them and 
and make sure that they represent the efforts for, for, for everyone that have, that have put into this program. Now, uh, uh, let, let me follow that up once again. Obviously, that's going to change the off-season off dynamics for you and your coaching staff also. Now, we know the relationships that coaches build with their players uh, throughout their tenure uh, with them. But you're going to be in a unique position. Obviously, one of your goals now, instead of bringing in new kids, is going to help get your current roster placed at other, other schools while yourself ultimately finding another place to uh to continue your use your talents and to, and to coach at so what are you anticipating this off season to be like given these unique dynamics well that's, that's a great question um you know my, my my focus first and foremost is in our players number one uh we we want to make sure we have a great season and we're doing our best to compete because ultimately that is going to put them in their the best position that they can be in to move forward and have continued opportunities to play baseball. And, and number two, my focus is on helping all of these players, both my current players and incoming recruits, to find places to play. They're all very passionate about baseball. They want to continue their athletic careers. And we have some really good ball players that, that deserve to keep on playing this great game. Um, for me personally and the staff, you know, I, I believe that um, – It'll take care of itself over time. We'll have to see how the season plays out, and we get into the summer and 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 see what's available and and see what the options are. Well, Coach Mike Coker here. Uh, is this a rallying cry for your players? Have the players? Have you noticed a a different attitude, a different play? Are guys getting to ground balls they normally wouldn't get to ever since the announcement? Because Normally something, and I saw this uh, a few years ago with a, a one HBCU program that canceled uh, in mid-season. Things just unbelievable things started happening. It, uh, what's the outlook? What's what is, is different as it's happening since the announcement? I believe I believe you're going to see a, a a very tight knit team, a, a team that is really motivated to play for each other, and not that. We haven't had tight teams before and teams that really, you know, cared about each other. But I feel like it's a different level this year. Um, these guys are, are really pulling for each other. They, they've really come together. And, and I, I feel that alone is just going to increase the, the compete level and some of the little things that you're talking about. Just that little extra effort, that little extra motivation to not only – you know, perform for each other, but to also prove some people wrong that, you know, hey, listen, we, we deserve to we deserve to have a program here. All right. Well, Mike, you got anything else that you'd like to ask? Well, I do wanted to say to um, a coach uh, the, with the MEAC and you're playing the conference this year. Uh, where do you see the Eagles uh, heading uh, this year? Are we looking at a regional team? I think we're going to be right in the mix. I, I like our team a lot. We have some some very high end players. I, I believe our top two starters are as good as anybody in our conference. Uh, our number one is is going to pitch ninety four to ninety six and very likely to be a top five rounder. Our number two guy is not far behind him. He's Ryan Miller, number two, uh, was, was MEAC Rookie of the Year. He's been an All American. He's been All Conference. Um, very talented pitcher. We have a returning um, uh, Luis uh, De Leon. He's a preseason All-American. Uh, he's going to hit the middle of our lineup, and, and there are a lot of uh, talented players to surround him as well. I think a lot of our success is going to, you know, really determine on how some of our young guys, some of our freshmen acclimate to Division One, and, and some of our transfers act acclimate to Division One. But um, at the end of the day, I expect us to be in the mix and, and competing for a conference championship. All right, Coach, any, any final statements you want to get out to Eagle Nation here? I just want to say I, I, I've really enjoyed my time in the, in the conference, in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. It has been a, a pleasure to coach these young men that I've had the opportunity to coach these past 10 years. I, I feel there needs to be more opportunities out there for more African-American players to play college baseball. I, I really wish 
Major League Baseball would step up and intervene to at least try to do something to to keep this program afloat, to move forward. But at the end of the day, um, no matter where I end up or where my players are end up, we, we've all been very proud to represent North Carolina Central and the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. That is Coach Jim Kerner, North Carolina Central Eagles, running it back for one last time with the eagle on his chest. Uh, Coach, Coach Kerner, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day. All right, thank you. And what we're going to do right now as we get ready to bring in our next coach, we're going to take another quick break. You are watching the HBCU Historic Black Colleges Baseball Media Roundup presented by Black College Nines and the Black College Sports Network. We'll be right back after these messages. This is Brian Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap. YouTube at MyJBN Online and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. Have you had your Earth Blend Coffee today? At Earth Blend Coffee, we take pride in offering you the very best of beans across the world, blended and roasted to perfection, giving you superior quality and satisfying and flavorful taste. Experience the world in one cup with Earth Blend Coffee. Hello and welcome back to the BCSN's presentation of the Black College Baseball Media Roundup with Black College Nines as they are ranked the top 10 schools. Our next school that we have coming up is the number 17, Florida A&M University. And Coach Jamie Shoup, Coach, I'm going to turn it over to you and Michael. Coach, how are you? I'm well, Michael. How are you? It's always a pleasure talking to you, Coach. Every time I talk to you, it's always a learning experience, and it's always fun. Uh, even uh, when I we finally got a chance to meet at uh, when you played FIU in Miami, it was a pleasure to talk to you. It always has been, but Coach. I want to I, I want to get into uh, uh, you being the number seventh ranked team in in our poll, and. This is really unique to me because you were at Florida State. You were at a, a top-ranked powerhouse, and you left there to join Florida A&M. And what you've done since you've come to uh, FAMU Nation is you've gone on to the region, the NCAA regional, twice. You've turned that program around. The one thing that I look forward to every year is – your first 15 games, you're spanking teams. What is it that you're doing that you brought over from being a Seminole, a, a neighbor to Florida A&M? Yeah, well, Mike, I appreciate it. We, uh, we're, we're, you know, you, you talked about coming back to FAMU and, and uh, the two regional appearances that, that, we, uh, that we participated in were the first two in school history. Uh, really, those two are the highlights of my coaching career, and that includes the 21 years that I was at Florida State, the 10 College World Series appearances that we made during my tenure there. Uh, and really what made that so satisfying uh, as a head coach, you know, 
was not only just going to a regional tournament, being the you know the first two times the school had gone to the regional tournament, but to to do it with guys that had played at FAMU and had never experienced a regional tournament. Uh, my first year uh, going, the second year as a head coach here, uh, Brett Richardson, who's now the head coach at Alcorn State, and I think he's on your top ten, so you'll be interviewing him shortly. But just seeing him and, and knowing him, Brett was a lifelong friend. I, I actually coached Brett in middle school or uh, JV baseball back in the mid '80s uh, in Tallahassee. Brett's a local product from here, and just to be able to go with him and and walk into a regional tournament uh, with a guy that was a baseball baseball lifer but had never participated in the NCAA tournament was one of my again one of my top two highlights. The other one was. Uh, in 2019, uh, when we went to the regional tournament in in, uh, in Georgia at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, to be able to walk in with Anthony Robinson, a guy that had played at FAMU years before, and again another guy that's been a baseball lifer that had never experienced the NCAA regional tournament. So, uh, you know, we're proud of what we've accomplished so far. We know that this year is going to be a challenge from the get go for us. Uh, not only in MEAC play, but gosh, our schedule going into MEAC play starting this this coming up weekend against Stetson, who I think some people have actually ranked. Uh, our schedule is so tough. And then the MEAC, and gosh, all of college baseball is probably deeper and more competitive this year than any year that, that I've been involved in, including those years, that, you know, those formative years at Florida State. Well, well Michael, are, we have a question now from Charles Bishop of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. How you doing, Coach Shoup? I'm well, Charles. Uh, I wanted to fast forward a little bit. Uh, Florida a of course, is going to be joining the Southwestern Athletic Conference. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, joining the conference. Uh, how excited are you? And, and bringing that style of MEAG baseball to the Southwestern Athletic Conference. And more importantly, playing over there in the SWAC East. Uh, teams such as Jackson State. Uh, yourself, Alabama State, and and, and Bethune Cookman will all be uh, fighting it out over there in the SWAC East. Yeah, we're excited about the move to the SWAC. Uh, we've enjoyed our, our our you know our participation in the MEAC, but uh, and looking forward to this year, this last year playing in the MEAC, and you know we want to go out with a bang. We want to we want to try to defend our 2019 cha MEAC championship this year, but we also have an eye toward the SWAC. We realize that. Uh, Although both both leagues are very competitive, we feel like top to bottom the SWAC may be a little more competitive. So we feel like we got to get better to be able to compete, um, and we know that because you know every year we play South Alabama um, have have played them since I've have gotten here. Uh, about every other year we play Jackson State, uh, Bethune is coming over with us from the MEAC, so we're familiar with them. Um, and we played we played uh, Southern last in 2019 as a kind of a, a setup for a, a, for help, to help both of us get ready for the regional tournament. When they won the SWAC, we won the MEAC. Uh, we met in Pensacola and played two just scrimmages over there. Um, and then Alcorn State, we played them ba basically every year since I've been here. So we're very familiar with SWAC play. Uh, we're excited about the move, but we do feel like we're definitely going to have to get better to be able to compete for a championship in that conference. Are there subtle differences between MEAC uh, baseball and SWAC baseball? I, I think there is. I think the biggest difference, is, as it's been explained to me by Brett, as, as I mentioned, Brett Richardson at Alcorn State and I are good friends. He says it's just a little more athletic league. Um, he said offensively it's better and, you know, pitching maybe not quite as good. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's the challenge. Uh, um, both myself and my, my assistant coach, we only have one right now, both have pitching backgrounds. We both uh, – you know, we're two-way players in junior college, but both just pitchers at the D1 level. So uh, we're going to have to kind of pick up our game offensively, feel like a little bit, and continue to what we try to do pitching-wise. Uh, but we're excited about it. I mean, our administration, I think it was a great move for our school, our administration getting us in there. Uh, we're going to have to recruit better. And with that, you know, mentioning the administration, they've done a good job in helping us upgrade our facilities so that we can recruit better, so that we can compete in what we feel that's going to be a – a more competitive league. We, league. We've uh, just finished a new locker room. Uh, there's, there's, uh, it's already planned. It's already set to go down with a, a brand new sports turf field, uh, turf field, the whole, the whole infield, outfield uh, of our baseball field, new dugouts, new stadium, a grandstand area. 
Uh, so there's some changes happening, not only us moving to the SWAC, but uh, some changes that will happen behind the scenes by our administration to help us be able to recruit better to compete in that league. Sure thing. Thank, Thank you, you Charles. Mm -hmm. Coming up next, we have a question from Carlos Brown. So Carlos, we'll ask you to go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, morning, Carlos, coach. you there? Hey, yeah, Carlos. I'm here. Yes, How you doing, Coach? Appreciate I, I the time. Mm -hmm. um, talk about your relationships with uh, the coaches in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, Brett Richardson was a, an assistant coach for me at, at, at FAMU. Actually, when I got the job, when I was offered the job at FAMU, my first call was to Brett. Uh, he was out of coaching at that time, and I wanted to get him back involved because I knew him and I trusted him. And I guess any coach will tell you, um, you know, one of the biggest issues you have coaching or biggest factors in hiring somebody is the trust factor. And so I trusted Brett and, uh, you know, two years into it, we were able to win a MEAC championship and, and take the first team in FAMU history to, to the regional uh, in Gainesville. Um, so, you know, very familiar with him, very familiar with Omar at Jackson State and the style of play that they, you know, they, they've, always, they've always had. When I took the job at FAMU, uh, you know, coming from Florida State, I, the one thing I mentioned was that I wasn't trying to be Florida State, that if I had to look at a model for what I wanted the FAMU program to, to, try, to, to try to match or try to, you know, compare ourselves to, it was Alabama State. And, uh, you know, Jose's there. He's done a great job at, at, at that program. He's a good friend as well. Uh, we uh, spent a lot of time on the recruiting trail together. Uh, so very familiar with the coaches. Uh, their personalities are, are reflected in their style of play. And so uh, it goes back to what I said earlier. I know we're going to have to get better to be able to compete for a championship in the, in the SWAC uh, simply because of the great job that coaches do in that league. Coach, a follow-up question. Um, you, of course, have experience uh, playing in the regionals. As a conference, in both as the MEAC and the Southwestern Athletic Conference, what will it take – to not only continue to get to regional play, but also uh, get uh, uh, so, some more wins. And can a conference like Southwest Athletic Conference, can they up their play where they can get a, an at-large bid? Could they, is that an achievable goal? You know, I, I, obviously anything is achievable. It's a, it's a very hard goal to accomplish, I think. I think there are a couple of things that, that we're going to have to all get on board, and this is this is my opinion. Uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I, I can't say that everybody has the same opinion that I have, but I think there's a couple of things we're going to have to do. One is continue to recruit and get better players, as I mentioned. That's our goal every year, and I'm sure other coaches as well. Um, I think we got to we we got to play the same schedule everybody else plays. Uh, the reason I mentioned that, I you know, we played Southern and Carrick Jackson had done a great job there now moved on to professional baseball, just spoke to him last week. But, um, you know, we met in Pensacola to play. The only reason we met to play the week before the regional is because the SWAC and the MEAC were not playing baseball that week. We were off. So teams that win the SWAC currently and teams that win the MEAC currently have to sit for two weeks before they go into the NCAA tournament. We actually play our conference tournaments a week prior to everybody else playing theirs. So I think we've got to be – to be looked at as equals, we've got to be equal. And I think one thing we need to do is look at extending our season uh, and playing the same length of season everybody else. That gives us a chance, too, to be considered more legitimate in the NCAA eyes. It also gives us a chance to better prepare. And, you know, you sit for two weeks, that's kind of hard to do in baseball. Uh, you know, in baseball, you're playing four or five games a week usually. And then to have to sit for two weeks – waiting on the other teams to play their conference tournaments on a weekend that we're off, you know, you kind of go into that thing a little flat sometimes, a little stale. Uh, and there's nothing you can do to prepare for games. I mean, that's the whole essence of minor league baseball. So you, can't, you can't out coach playing sometimes. Yeah. So I think that's one step that I, you know, that I'll encourage the conference to do. I don't know if it'll happen. But I think we, it, it, for us to even talk about an at-large bid, I think, you know, those are mm -hmm. one of the steps that we're going to have to take to, to be looked at as equals, to have a, you know, equal opportunity to have an uh, uh, at-large invite from the SWAC. Thank you. All right. 
Carlos, thank you for your question. Coming up next, we have a question from AD Drew and following that, we will have another question from Mr. Michael Coker. So AD Drew, go ahead and please start your camera. All right, Coach, since Carlos brought out his swag head, I got I got to bring out my head uh, for you for this question. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, coach, uh, and it's, I've been asking this question to a lot, a lot of the other coaches. Uh, scheduling. Normally, we know how the schedule runs uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, looking at your schedule, you, pretty much your whole schedule is in Florida and Georgia up until – April, when you finally go to North Carolina, then you've got the one trip to uh, to Virginia. But because of where you, where FAMU is located at, a lot of teams normally come down to play you guys in Florida. What kind of challenges did you have this year with with those teams? Because normally you people people want to travel down to the South. You get your Northern teams want to travel down to the South, especially. Uh, late February, early March to get those uh, games in. So what kind of challenges have you had putting a competitive schedule together this year? Yeah, and if you look at that schedule, I, I think it's probably the most competitive schedule a family baseball team has ever played. Uh, and it's not what it usually is. Usually pre-COVID, we were able to bring some of the teams down from north that hadn't really been outside, you know, the navies, the armies, the, the you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, just different teams from up north that we played. And that kind of gave us an advantage because of, uh, you know, because we had been outside a lot being from Florida, they had it. But uh, this year with COVID, not a lot of teams are traveling. So that kind of, that allowed us and forced us, uh, allowed us by the, by the other teams from down south, weren't bringing the northern teams down either because of COVID. So they were looking for games. Uh, and and it, 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 it made it necessary for us to play those you know, a little bit more competitive teams, better teams. Uh, if you look at our schedule, we open up against Stetson. Some world polls have them in the top 30 in college baseball. Uh, we open up this weekend with them. The next weekend's at South Florida, you know, major Division One power usually. Um, and then the third weekend, we're only at number one ranked Florida for a weekend series. Uh, we also have, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Stetson, they're picked to win uh, their conference, the A-Sun. Uh, we also have the number two team picked in that conference, uh, Florida Gulf Coast, coming in about our fourth or fifth weekend. Um, and also in the middle of that is, is a SWAC, MEAC Challenge weekend against Grambling, which we're certainly looking forward to. We appreciate the Atlanta Braves doing all they've done to, to put that tournament together, I think the fourth weekend of the season, uh, that series together. We're playing in the AAA uh, Atlanta Braves Stadium in Gwinnett County. So we're looking forward to that as well. It is, without question, a very challenging, uh, I call it preseason, because really the season for us all circulates around the, the MEAC, you know, the MEAC schedule and also pre-conference uh, uh, games are, are as tough as we've ever had, certainly since I've been here and probably in the history of the program. So uh, COVID had kind of made it that tough because, again, the Northern schools weren't coming down, but it also gave us the opportunity. I told the guys, there's, there's two think, ways you can look at it. You can look at it as a challenge or an opportunity. And we got to look at it as an opportunity because it's certainly a challenging schedule, no doubt, looking just at the, the ranked teams on our schedule right now. But we look at it as an opportunity. We're, we're excited about getting to play those guys. All right, my, my final question before I turn it over to Michael Coker is, uh, you know, Fam, you has, uh-oh. I'm going to match you, man. <laughs> I, I got another one around here with with with, with, uh, with a fang on it. I, I should have put that one on also. Yeah. But uh, you know, fam, you had at one point in time had a a rich tradition with the likes of Andre Dawson and Vince Coleman uh, co coming through playing on that field. You know, they say Andre Dawson hit a home run uh, off of the field that still has not come down yet. Uh, <laughs> you know, that was the legend that they told me when I was there back in the nineties. But uh, just kind of talk about uh, how you have rebuilt that tradition and t uh, t taking that tradition into your, your new ventures that you'll be going into in 21. Yeah, you can't talk about tradition at FAMU without talking about Andre Dawson. And he looks like he could probably still hit a home run, a, a towering home run. He's still in great shape. Uh, and, you know, we reached out to him when I first got the job as well and came and spent some time. Uh, he came and spent some time back at FAMU. So, well, uh, the tradition is great. Vince Coleman was back last year here. 
uh, Hal McRae, you know, the first uh, African American manager of a baseball, uh, professional major league baseball team. Um, uh, Marquise Grissom, you know, going up to Atlanta to play, and you can't think of the Braves without thinking about Marquise Grissom. So, there's just been such a rich tradition of FAMU baseball. Um, you know, really, um, it's it's all about money. You know, it is. I mean, the, the facilities needed to get better, and they've started to get better. As I said, we're we're getting ready to build a put a, a, a brand new uh, playing surface, uh, field turf in next year. Um, uh, so it, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because yeah, I just reached out, just put a letter together that will go out to former baseball players about helping us continue to build what we've tried to build in the last seven or eight years that I've been here and reestablish the tradition of FAMU baseball. Uh, you're not going to do that in this day and time without money, you know, without better facilities and, and uh, so that you can recruit better players. And our administration now understands that. Uh, they're really proactive in, in trying to make sure that once our guys get here, our players get here, our student athletes, they have a great, a great college experience. And a lot of that is stuff. You know, kids these days, when you recruit, they like stuff. They like to see how many uniforms you got. They like to see, make sure they're going to get their meal money, you know. Uh, just treating guys right. Uh, that's the main thing with, with anything in, in life. You just treat people right, good things happen. And that's what we try to do here with our program. And I like the new hat there, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love it. Uh, all right, Michael, we give it to you. Uh, get ready to close this out. Coach, I want to I wanna talk about what Carlos Brown stated to you regarding playing teams' strength of schedule. You and I had a conversation a few years ago and it, it I, I drove that conversation because your second year, you and Bethune-Cookman had the highest uh, rating percentage index, which is better known as the RPI, of any HBCU. I think you were in the, in the top 30 at that time. And to the NCAA regionals, they only take the, the one team from each conference, from HBCU conference, from one team, the winner from the uh, MEAC and the winner from the SWAC. Now, if we are to get a second and, and a third, maybe a fourth team in, uh, we had discussed what was needed as far as a uh, rating percentage index. How do we get that as to where we can become an at-large bid? What must HBCUs do, especially FAMU, to – if you don't win the MEAC conference outright, but you can still get that at large? You know, that, that's that's a great question. And, and that's a great uh, kind of example of what you were speaking of. Because the year you mentioned that our RP was so high, we were fifth in the country in hitting. We could hit, man. We were second in on-base percentage in the country. And, and uh, I think we were eighth in run score. But we didn't win the MEAC tournament that year. Therefore, our season was over. There was no at-large bid granted to us. Um, the answer, unfortunately, with anything or with most things, there's not a quick fix for that. Uh, I mentioned trying to make sure that we do things just like every other conference does. I think that's important. But I'll tell you this, and I, and I think any coach – I mean, you were just talking about uh, – just talking to North Carolina Central. Um they got a good program, man. They didn't even make the MEAC tournament the last couple of years, and they got a great program. They got great players. Baseball in the MEAC and in the SWAC has grown, has gotten gotten better every single year, and it continues to get better. So I think if we continue with what we're doing and hiring the good coaches and, and hopefully, like Central was talking about, keeping those programs alive, you're going to see through time things change a little bit. Um, the same conversation we're having in the SWAC and the MEAC, you know, the ASUNs have it. The other conferences, the smaller conferences are, are having as well about how to make sure that their brand is still worthy of, of getting an at-large bid. So it's not just for us, the, you know, SWAC and the MEAC, it's for other conferences too because the, the ACCs and the SECs, the bigger conferences, the Power Five conferences are dominating that conversation right now. Um, we go to Florida and play. It's important for me that we represent ourselves well there. And I'm sure you ask any coach in the SWAC and any coach in the MEAC when we go to those big-time college programs, it's important that we represent, represent our programs, but not only our programs, but the smaller school stigma somewhat 
uh, and that we start to change that. I think it's already taken place. I mean, we beat Florida my, my first year here. They were six in the country at the time. Uh, you see, you know, you see it every Southern, you see them beating some, you know, some, some big time college baseball programs. I think we're on the right track. I think we need to be somewhat patient. Again, try to get the scheduling to look the same, the season, the length of the season to look the same, and just continue to do what we do. Uh, hire good coaches that care about their kids and, and their student athletes, and, and uh, you know, they coach to coach men, not just to coach good baseball players, but to coach these kids and become, into becoming men. And I think you'll see that happen, but I don't think there's a quick fix for that. You know, most of the things that are sustainable, they're not quick fixes. So I think this is one that's uh, that's going to be tough because, again, we don't fight that fight alone. It's it's something that the ASUN will tell you. It's something that the Patriot League will tell you. It's something that other conferences, you know, they'll tell you the same thing. They're frustrated sometimes. I was frustrated that year. Um you know, I felt like we could hit with anybody. We couldn't pitch. We weren't great off. You know, we were weren't great from the from the mound that year. But dang, we could hit with anybody in the country. We stayed home and watched the regional tournament on television. So it was somewhat frustrating. But again, as long as I've been in this game, it's somewhat understandable as well. Well, you coach, said something. Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, coach. Uh, if you don't mind, we want, we want to ask you to stay around just a, a few extra minutes. Uh, Coach James Cooper of Grambling, uh, uh, we're still awaiting this, uh, on him to join us. So do you mind hanging around for a couple more minutes? We've got no, a couple more people want to get some questions in. No, no problem. Looking forward to that tournament. Looking forward to playing Grambling this year. All right, go ahead, Michael. Cool. And then after Michael asks his follow-up, we'll bring on Dr. Uh, Kenyatta Caville. Well, just, just, just a, a noteworthy item here. The year you beat Florida, Kevin Sullivan, their head coach, said that we got to be prepared a little bit better because this is the state of Florida and we need to maintain our bragging rights. I don't know if you were aware of that. Was not. I was well, not. now you are. Yeah. 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 And I've, known, I've known Sully for, for years. Actually, as I said, we, he reached out this year and gave us the opportunity to come there and play him. So um, that's, you know, that's certainly good to hear coming from him. Uh, and we haven't gotten better, uh, but we still, I mean, this, you know, we've got to get, we've got to get better facilities. We've got to recruit better. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, and that's not just FAMU. That's all of the, the, the MEAC and that's all the SWAC. And gosh, I'm telling you, people don't realize how good HBCU baseball is. I mean, it is getting better every day. Amen to uh, that. So we just have to continue that trend and just keep grinding and keep working. Uh, and I think you're going to see a very bright future for, for HBCU baseball. Looking forward to joining the SWAC and, and uh, helping build the tradition of the SWAC, continue to build the tradition of the SWAC. All right, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. Yeah, this is Dr. Cavill with Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Good to speak with you, Coach Shoop. I hope all is going well with you, your family, and your team, uh, certainly during this time. A tremendous uh, work that you're doing down there at FAMU. And wanted to tie in a little question that you spoke about earlier with the classic, uh, as well as the continued growth and building of HBCU programs, and therefore the brands as you extend that uh, in the marketplace. Obviously, Atlanta pushed forward with the Ralph Gar, Bill Lucas HBCU classic presented by Truist. And you spoke a little bit about it, but I, I wanted to put it in that branding framework uh, for you to expand on it a little bit. And this is where I'm going with that. You see, as you talked about the larger brands playing in these major league ballparks um, across Houston, Atlanta, Dallas, and now you're seeing the emergence of uh, maybe some of these HBCU classes getting the same opportunity. Um, along with what you said earlier, the importance of this, how does this help create the brand endurance of the MEAC and now as you move into the SWAC of building it up, giving you a opportunity uh, to market this in such a way uh, for your program as you continue to build on your home facilities as well. You know, visibility is so important because uh, you know, when 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 you're playing in a in a, a, a alumni hotbed like Atlanta is for FAMU, it's so important for us to be there because you know kids they're, they're what they're familiar with, what they see, and what they hear is what they think about and. For us to be in Atlanta with the alumni base that we have there, 
uh, it's certainly a great opportunity for us. It helps us in recruiting. You know, you're always recruiting. You know, you're always, your brand is always there, either, either in a negative sense or a positive sense. A sense. So uh, we appreciate the Braves, uh, you know, reaching out and allowing us this opportunity. It's a, it's a great place for us to recruit from. Uh, not only is Georgia baseball great, but uh, the alumni base, as I mentioned, is, is, is good in the, in, you know, it, FAMU alumni is strong in, in the Atlanta area. Uh, so it's just a great opportunity for us. Uh, the visibility, you can't put a price on that. Uh, that's huge. You know, we have had the opportunity. My second year here, I think it was, yeah, we played in, in uh, Fenway Park in Boston, actually right. played Central um, in that park. And, our, you know, our guys were just in all of the facilities and the surroundings. And that just kind of helped further put us on the map and continue to keep us relevant. You know, that's the key. It's just in, in kids' mind, when they, the more they hear FAMU, the more opportunities that gives me from a recruiting standpoint. So it's huge, man. Visibility is the key. And, and because recruiting is the key for us to be successful, so the more visible we are, the more it helps us in that sense. Thank you for sharing that, Coach. Good luck this season. Thank you. Stay safe. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, everyone. We want to take this time to thank Coach Shoup again for coming in and, and hanging out with us, uh, all these other folks and us Rattlers. So we're going to do <laughs> – Coach, again, we hope you guys have a great season and continue. And uh, just one of the things we love to say, we are definitely looking forward to that that moves to the SWAC and what that baseball is going to look like. And uh, we're definitely excited about being a part of moving that forward. So thank you again, Coach Shoot. Appreciate it. Appreciate all you do for college baseball. man. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to take us a quick commercial break. We'll be back. Uh, we are awaiting Coach James Cooper of Grambling State, but we do have Coach Crenshaw of Southern University on deck. So if we get it in there, we'll be having a few things going on. So we'll be back with more of the BCSN 2021 HBCU or Black College Baseball Roundup. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. Shop Melbourne Online Women's Boutique to spice up your closet with trendy, unique looks. We have fashionable and chic looks at very affordable prices. Melbourne Boutique offers free shipping all year long on all orders. Shop online at www.melbourneboutique.com. That's www.m-e-l-b-e-t-b-o-u-t-i-q-u-e.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. Shop Melbourne Online Women's Boutique. Clinton Parish and Tampa's my community. I grew up here, went to school here, and my wife and I make our home here. What makes Tampa special are its people. So when I represent someone injured in my community, it's personal. Call my office and speak to a real lawyer and not some referral service. I will fight the insurance companies to get the settlement that you deserve. At the law office of Clinton Parish, we take the pain out of being hurt. Welcome back to the BCSN Black College Baseball Roundup uh, presented by Black College Nines. Joining us today from Black College Nines is Michael Coker. And also on screen with us right now from inside Dr. Cavill's uh, HBCU Sports Lab featuring Mike, Mike Washington and Charles Bishop is Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. So, so, uh, still morning in your neck of the woods, Dr. Cavill. It's afternoon where, where I am at. So uh, we, talked, we talked earlier about Black College Nines. Uh, let's take a moment while we're waiting on Coach Crenshaw. If you would kind of tell everybody a little bit about Inside the HBCU Sports Lab for those who may not be familiar with uh, Inside the Sports Lab. Thank you for that opportunity. We are a radio streaming platform. 
when we talk about HBCU sports, we like to say all things HBCU sports, large and small, uh, NEIA to the NCAA, all divisional classifications in that area. Uh, we broadcast every Tuesday live, 6 o'clock Central Standard Time, um, and we just provide you all the information you get from uh, HBCU platform with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. All right, and now we have our number five team, Southern University. Southern was the defending 2019 SWAC champion. Uh, right now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Coker, let Michael Coker tell us a little bit more about Southern baseball, and then we'll let him introduce Coach Crenshaw. Coach, how are you? How you doing? All righty. Coach Crenshaw, um, coming into this season, well, I'm going to take you back to the, the year that you shocked the nation. And I say that because the previous year, Southern, the Jaguars was 9-33, and 33, and then they turned it around. I, and I want to say this to you. And correct me if I'm wrong. I think, and I'm not taking anything away from the former head coach, uh, Garrett Jackson. But when you became a part of that team, I think you were that driving force that got the kids to buy in to not only what Coach Jackson was doing, because I don't want to take anything away from him, but you were that driving assistant that turned that team around. You helped turn that team around. You helped cultivate those young kids into a winning attitude and it showed on the field. Now you took that you took that from that me attitude and gave them that we because in your overview you stated that and it let me it, it got me to thinking uh you know that's that's something that kids don't hear too much about or it doesn't get reported. But once you was hired to replace uh, uh coach Jackson you have you it seems to me like that sort of attitude is what you're approaching the 2021 season yes that's correct it's gonna take the whole group to to do a, a decent job and have a good season so if we all in together then nobody else can inform anything against us well just seeing you for the first time are you sure you're 25 or 21 I wish. <laughs> you look kind of young there, Coach. Are you sure you're a coach? Yeah. You look like you're still playing. I wish that too, but no, nah, my playing days are long behind. Okay, well, that being said, uh, Coach, coming in, you are – Southern, you are a fifth-ranked team. Uh, you've got some, some parameters in place with, as far as recruiting – because uh, you've 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 done a really good job in recruiting this year, uh, you've gotten some players that are coming in. Um, one of the things you have a kid that came in from Texas, and it really sent shockwaves. Not because he pitched at Texas, it's because he, he made a statement, uh, and he, he didn't. Went to Texas Southern. He didn't come to Southern. Well, okay, maybe I'm getting it mixed up there because. Uh, at one point, he was considering going to Southern. And uh, I don't know if you were aware of that. I'm sorry. You talking about Cameron Fields? Uh, yes. Yeah, he's at Texas Southern. Okay, he's well, okay. Okay, I, I apologize for that because we, uh, our information had him going to Southern at oh, first. No. Okay, I'm uh, glad you corrected me on that because if that was the case, then – from what I, I would have liked to have them. Well, yeah, <laughs> but, but you're. No, we never, we didn't, we never really got deep conversation. Uh, I guess he decided to stay in the state of Texas and go to school, which is fine. Can't get them off. Well, the, uh, the Michael, let's do this. Michael, I'm sorry. Let's do this before your next question. We actually have a question from Keisha Kelly of the Black College Experience. So we're going to ask her to come on at this point. Uh, Keisha, you should be able to unmute your microphone and give her okay. that. Got, got to give her that opportunity to get her question in the coach. 
Hey, Coach Crenshaw, everybody was representing for FAMU, so I'm going to do it right, and I'm going to represent for those Southern Jaguars in the background, class of 2003. But I am. I'm, I'm, I'm Black College Experience, uh, class of 2003 Southern University. My question is because we keep talking about the stats and the, and, and the, the kids and how they're coming. My question is, is during this pandemic, it's a, it's a two-part question. The first thing, how are you recruiting? Because I know a lot of coaches, I, I'm, I'm really heavy on Twitter, and I know a lot of coaches do a lot of recruiting via social media. I know Twitter is a heavy recruiting space. How are you recruiting at this time? And then the other part of the question is, how are the students adjusting to, you know, the pandemic? I know there's like, you know, campus is really scarce in most places. So how are the students adjusting? What is that mental health like for those uh, athletes? Uh, well, to start out with question number two about the athletes, uh, it's, it's the ongoing adjustment for the, as far as COVID and the pandemic. Uh, we try to spend a lot of time with each other, either on the field or I try to get them guys to hang out with each other so they don't have to venture out and hang around other people. Uh, for us, Staying, uh, staying away from positive COVID tests keeps us on the field and they get to do what they like to do uh, and have fun doing it. Um, so like it's still ongoing. Uh, we're still making adjustments to everything that we have to do along with the, the protocols. Uh, and on the recruiting aspect, uh, yeah, a lot of it's doing, uh, done uh, via Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, we also on the phone a lot, calling people, uh, emailing coaches. So, I mean, we hitting it on all avenues right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank all right. You. Our next question is going to be from Mr. Charles Bishop of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Yes, yeah, Coach Crenshaw, Charles Bishop from uh, Dr. Fields inside the HBCU Sports Lab. And I wanted you to kind of give us a little bit of an overview of uh, Southern's baseball team this upcoming season. I know that you have a lot of uh, newcomers coming in, but uh, kind of flesh out the roster and, and, and what you have come uh, uh, that's going to be on the field this year. Uh, we have, a, I would like to say we have a experienced, experienced, unexperienced team. We got a bunch of guys that have played to play baseball a lot, uh, but as far as playing among each other, we haven't had much experience doing that. Uh, practice got cut short in the fall. Uh, I was named the head coach in December. Uh, we've been back now practicing, uh, trying to get things done as far as the team, but with the with the rain, the snow, the ice, uh, we've been mixing it in, just trying to get in, find somewhere to get inside to, to do some stuff as a team. Uh, it's hard to scrimmage and all of that right now with the weather. Sure thing. Uh, with regards to uh, just trying to uh, get some good practices in, if you will, uh, what are some of the unique challenges that you kind of come across in terms of trying to get the team prepared for the season? Uh, pretty much it's been just the rain in the, the field. Uh, our outfield holds water. Uh, we're working on trying to figure out ways for it to drain. Uh, better uh, so it won't be so much standing water uh, we've had a couple scrimmages uh, we've used the practice we've used the football field a couple times to to get out there and get something done we got a portable mound that we pull out and we we scrimmage on the uh, football stadium so we've had about six scrimmages uh, so far I would like to have been around 12 by now but mm -hmm. I mean we got to do what we got to do sure I'm not thing. Making thank you coach All right, and it looks like our next question will be from Mr. Carlos Brown. Uh, Carlos, go ahead and start your video. Good morning, Coach. Appreciate the time. Carlos Brown with the Carlos Brown Show. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Coach had a chance to look at that schedule. Mind you, I know uh, the games with Oklahoma is going to be not happening, but Wow, what a tough schedule. Did, did you have a part in that or it was something that you inherited? Uh, I, me and Coach Jackson worked together uh, in the schedule. I would come to him with teams and he would tell me, figure out a way to get it done. And uh, so it was kind of 60% me, 40% Coach Jackson. And then in the end, it was all me. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I was looking forward to playing Oklahoma just to see if we got to test ourselves early. But the weather and all of that's playing out. We're looking for games right now. Uh, so 
But I think we got a tough schedule to 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 test us to see where see where we are, both out of conference and in conference. Uh, I think the teams that we're playing going to bring that uh, intensity that we're going to face in conference play. Coach, will there be uh, some more opportunities to play some in-state schools because the state of Louisiana they have tremendous college baseball programs. Yeah, I would like to play uh, other schools in the state. Uh, the way it worked out, we have a lot of Southland Conference schools in our state. So those guys went to four-game weekend series, and it's kind of tough to play four games and play a midweek game. Uh, those four games and, and the way that conference set up, I think they got them close to to 42 games, I believe, 40 games. Uh then you had the three weeks of non-conference games that led up to about 56 for them. So it was hard to to play those those in-state schools in the middle of the week like we tried to. Thank you, Coach. No problem. All right, Carlos, thank you. Coming up next, we have Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. This is uh, Dr. Cavill with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Um, now Justin, get the picture on there. Coming How you in doing? There. I'm doing well. Good to have you, Coach Crenshaw. Wanted to ask you, last year you were the uh, hunted in a lot of ways, <laughs> and this year <laughs> you will be hunted. So just want to talk about your philosophy. Is it different when you go into the season with that mindset, or do you have a philosophy with your team in regards to uh, keeping a level set uh, in, a, in, in what you bring as a philosophy? And I guess that kind of shift. Now that you're the head person, is that the same or is it similar? Give us a little in-depth. Give us behind the scenes, Coach. I know at times y'all don't want to let us inside the locker room. We want to get a little more feeling about the Southern Jaguars. It's a great program down there now. Yes, uh, it's got a lot of tradition, and that's what I try to remind our guys. Uh, I had a talk with my team about two weeks ago, and I told them, I said, look, it's not y'all fault that you're in the seat that you're in. It's because of the people before you. They laid the foundation, and it's it's still some schools that haven't recovered from that those years where those other guys played. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be everybody's Yankees. So we got to show up to play. And <laughs> so far, they've been buying in. Uh, we've been working hard. I hadn't had any anybody uh, say they didn't want to do it. Everybody seems to be uh, very alert and getting after it. Um, we've had good intense practices when we've had chances to get out on the field, but. I mean, I just try to remind those guys, hey, they coming for you. The last championship that was played, we won it. And then years before that, I mean, we were winning championships. So, like, I try, I try to remind them in a nice way that, look, guys, it's really not your fault that you're in this, this position that you're about to go through this season. I really like you taking us behind the curtain and in that locker room. I really appreciate that, Coach. Uh, a lot of uh, fans are big about that. And as you talk about it, uh, we hear it all the time on this side, talking about the S on your chest. So sounds like uh, they're learning uh, or if they haven't already learned. With that, the second part of that, let me go a little further into that. I know your focus, you look at game by game, week to week, and it's important context that when you talk about players. But if you would, from a media perspective, if you would allow us, talk a little bit now with the framework from an overall perspective from the SWAC, with the expansion of Bethune-Cookman and FAMU. Um, obviously, the SWAC was a very proud, historic program. Uh, for the longest, it was dominated by Southern, as you talked about, Jackson State and Grambling, to some degree, maybe all point. And most recently, it has expanded, gotten bigger uh, and better and deeper, if you would allow me to use that framework, with Prairie View and then Texas Southern and Alabama State. And you have the other ones, in, uh, you know, getting back into that mix. Now you add these programs that were top programs in the MEAC coming into the to the SWAC. What does that do for the overall brand of the SWAC? Uh, obviously, Southern leads that in a lot of ways, but give us a big perspective of what that does in terms of pushing the SWAC and how does that ele elevate Southern in any way? Well, first off, I would like to take some of that pressure off of us. Uh, <laughs> we're just trying, we, hey, we just fitting in with everybody else in the conference. Uh, but but those like those they bring in some uh, – they bring in some Florida flavor, so it opens up recruiting for us. So that's how I look at it. We need to go recruit in Florida a little bit more to get some players to come play for us at Southern University. Um, but as far as 
the conference over life, we've always been a good uh, baseball conference. Uh, a lot of people probably never respected the conference because of uh, the setup, but I thought I've always thought highly of the conference. I played in the conference as a as a player, and now I'm back coaching in it for my eighth year now in the league. So I mean, from top to bottom, I think every team is competitive. Uh, they all offer different uh, styles of play. Um, but I'm excited. Uh, we got a good – it's a good group of coaches in our league right now. Uh, so, with Mike Rob, Mike Robertson over at Texas Southern, uh, Coach Omar Johnson over at Jackson State, Coach Vasquez at Alabama State, and Coach Cooper, and the rest of the coaches, Coach James, uh, Coach Richardson. I'm excited. Uh, I can't think of the Valley coach name. Coach, uh, coach Stevens. So, like I said, we got a deep group of coaches in this league, and I think we all had different ways of going about our program and getting our players excited to play. No doubt about it, Coach, um, as we have our lead. Oh, and Coach Rick, by the way, at Prairie View, he does a good job as well. There you go. Get them all in. I like the way you shifted <laughs> pressure. That's smart, Coach. You know, uh, I see a baseball correspondent, analyst, if you would, Michael Coker, talk about your, your age and your look. I'll just say this. You certainly a season because that was a smart way to make sure that you deflect and make sure everybody gets a little bit of this pressure love around here. And yeah, because, I, I need the pressure to be on them guys. I just want my guys to show up and play. I certainly I like all I like all the press going to Alabama State. That's a good that's a that's a good thing. I don't like the bullseye on my back. Yeah, <laughs> smart man, smart man, coach. Uh, with that, I'll shift it back over to the rest of the team. Appreciate your time. Thanks for all you do with the program. Stay safe. You too. All right, uh, Coach. We're gonna let Michael Coker come back in here, and I think we're gonna see if he has, if he doesn't have another question, give you an opportunity to get your last comments in. Uh, Coach Richardson actually has joined us, so we will let him know we will be bringing him in shortly. Um, so, Mike, do you have anything else that you would like to ask, Coach? Yes, uh, Coach Crenshaw. Throughout. The 2020 season, you're very much aware of the health crisis that we we faced with. How has this helped recruiting? How has it hindered your efforts to recruit? And what have you done to get by the pandemic uh, to protect yourself, your players, and get recruits in? Uh, I read a couple books. Uh, I read this book called It Take What It Takes. Uh, I also read another book. Uh, I think it's chop wood. I can't remember. It's chop wood something. But uh, and then we had a couple team reads. We did some team zooms. Uh, on the recruiting aspect, it was kind of bad. I like to get out and go watch games. I'm a recruiter at heart. Uh, I like to go watch. Uh, I like I tell my players, I do a whole lot of watching. I don't do a whole lot of playing. So I see y'all see what's going on a lot. Uh, but we got some guys. Uh, we made a couple calls, some video, of course. Um, I'm excited about my team. Uh, I think we're going to be able to put a, a good brand, a, a good product out there to say as far as with the student athletes. That, okay. with, that being, with that being said, uh, the 2021 season, what can we expect from uh, Southern baseball? And I got to put you on that spot. Uh, I expect us to come out and play hard. I wouldn't ask them to, to do anything other than that. Play hard and play smart. Play fast. Thank you, Coach. No problem. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and take a break. With that being said, uh, Coach, thank you again for your time. And we will be back with our next coach, Coach Robertson of Tech Southern. And we'll be right back with more of the BCSN's 2021 Black College Baseball Media Roundup. and one-of-a-kind treats for any occasion. Sugar Chateau is currently shipping cakes in a jar, offering a variety of different flavors in a single-serve container that can help you celebrate in accordance with social distancing. Place your orders today by calling 803-526-7895 or visiting SugarChateauDesserts.com. True Black Essentials is a retail opportunity to bring black businesses under one roof where every product on every shelf in every aisle will be black owned and black produced by people all over the world. 
Statistics show that the $1.3 trillion of spending power that we have as black people can easily be turned into each black person having $2 billion if we were to shop black for two years. So True Black Essentials will launch an e-commerce store on November 1st, 2020, but we will open up brick and mortar stores in Atlanta, New Orleans, Charlotte, Houston, and Jacksonville with the very first store opening in Atlanta, June 19th, 2021. Sports Network and all of our shows on YouTube. You can find us at MyJBN Online and on all social media at MyBCSN1. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dash as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. All right, we're, we're back here live on the Black College Nines, Black College Baseball Media Roundup, brought to you by the Black College Sports Network. We've got multiple members of Black media joining us here today. Asking, uh, asking questions of our HBCU baseball head coaches. Uh, thus far, we've talked to Coach Antoine Riggins of Prairie View, our number 10 team. Coach Bratton of Alcorn State, number nine, was unable to join us. Did talk to uh, Coach Kerner of North Carolina Central, our number 18. Our number 17, Coach J Jamie Shoup of Florida A&M University uh, talked with us. Coach James Cooper of Grambling was unable to join us thus far today. We did talk with Coach Crenshaw, number five, Southern, number four. And now we're looking at bringing in our number four head coach, Michael Robertson of Texas Southern, Coach Robinson is having a couple of technical issues trying to get in. We have been in communication with him, so hopefully we get those technical issues resolved in just a few moments. But, Michael, uh, if you would, uh, the coaches that we've talked to thus far today, is there anything that any one of them said uh, quickly that has stuck out in your mind thus far? Coach Jamie Shoops, in it's something that I, 
I look at heavy when I look at these teams and I uh, put our analysis together for our voters to vote. We are heavily driven by the uh, rating percentage index. That is the standard that is used. And what it does is it, it puts your strength of schedule versus another team's strength of schedule, and it gets you ranked. Uh, it, 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 it helps for, like, when the NCAA tournament comes around, because I think that a, a, it is a travesty that we only have two teams from HBCUs, whether one from the SWAC and one from the MEAC. That's not awarding uh, teams, especially when you have teams from the ACC, the SEC, uh, the Big 12, and the Big 10, when they send five, six teams, and there are times when they have a team that doesn't have that high RPI, but because they're in that top-ranked conference, they're in that power five. And there's not enough emphasis put on the mid-majors. There's not enough emphasis put on, especially HBCUs, as to where... As an example, you know, if Jackson State buses out and, and wins 40 games and then Alabama State wins 35 and then FAMU wins 30, that should be enough to get an at-large bid. But the thing that is that is heavily relied, up, uh, relied upon is the RPI ranking. And I think that something should be – HBCUs – and he's right, should do a better job in, in, in uh, getting recruits to knock down those barriers that are in place. Although it's a good barrier because it's it's keeping teams, you, you want your team to, to go up against the best. But a lot of that does not get rewarded at HBCUs. I think there are times when we've had uh, some teams that, uh, you take uh, Jackson State, for example. Jackson State wins 30 ball games or more a season. Uh, that should be enough, whether they win the conference title or not, that should be enough to get them into a regional. Uh, maybe not hosting, but playing the regional. So what Jamie Shopes really uh, stuck out in my mind was, is we need to do a better job in recruiting so that we can get these ball players in that's going to get us that high RPI rating because uh, – Jamie Shope's second year, we had two Florida programs from the MEAC that was ranked high in the RPI. Now, I got excited. I'm thinking that this is going to carry on to the end of the season, and they didn't because it, it, they ended up losing, and they sat at home and didn't really make the conference tournament. But uh, that RPI is important, This that strength of schedule. It sends shockwaves. It sends notice. And for HBCUs, we the, our baseball programs need to do a, a, a better job in recruiting so we can get those arms in that throw 90 consistently, uh, 98. Uh, we only have one team that has a guy that throws 98, and he plays with um, uh, North Carolina Central. So, right. so that, that, I think that should be uh, one of the things that our programs need to really uh, concentrate on. All right, uh, Michael, uh, looks like Coach Robertson was – he came on. We lost him. He came back on. We were actually never able to bring him on screen. So if you would give us a quick 30 seconds about Texas Southern before we – while we get Coach Ben Hall from uh, North Carolina A&T ready. Just wanted to say, I think, Mike – Coach Mike Robinson's on. He may not did be he, Did he get back on? Oh, he did get back on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cavill. And he's been going in and out. Coach Robinson, are you there? Still waiting on his audio to do that. Why, why, why we try to work this out one last time, Michael, if you could give us maybe a quick 30 to 45 seconds on your uh, outlook on Texas Southern. Texas Southern is led by Michael Robertson. Ever since my reporting on HBCU baseball, I look at Texas Southern as a second half ball club. And I know college baseball does not play 100 games, but if they played 100 games, Michael Robertson would coach them to a 25 and 25 uh, first half season. 
The second half, he might go 49-1. and one. He is one of your top coaches who makes changes at the mid-season uh, level. He doesn't gamble. He He's a good baseball analysis. He realizes where the changes need to be. And this is a testament of his style of play. Michael Robertson is one of your true baseball doctors. I say that because if you look at his history, they come out of nowhere. They come out of nowhere and they will beat you and they will shock you. Uh, he has gone to the regionals back to back. That's the first time in 25 years that has happened at the HBCU ranks. That third year, he had a shot. I think a few errors would have changed the course of that, and it would have been his third year. Uh, and that's a testament to his coaching style and the type of person he is. Texas Southern will be there every year, and no matter what in the swag. And if you look at their their first game, they're playing a, a, a good-ranked ball club in, in the in a National Collegiate Baseball Writers Poll. They're receiving votes the Houston Cougars. They're constantly playing ranked teams. If uh, if you remember, they beat that Mississippi State last year. They really shocked them because they, they beat their number one midweek guy who was throwing 96. So if you really want a, a coach that's going to lead a program and make those adjustments, that's going to get elevate your program to win games during the season, watch what Michael Robertson does. All right. Uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do right now. We're going to bring in our coach of our number three team who's been patiently waiting on the line for us. That is Coach Benjamin Hall. Go ahead and introduce Coach Hall, Mike, while, while he gets everything set up. Coach Ben Hall, how are you? It's Michael Coker, Black College Nines. Sorry about the delay, but how are you, Coach? Doing good, guys. Good, good to good to be here, and obviously excited to talk a little baseball. Well, Coach, let's let's get into the swing of things. You are uh, coaching one of the better programs in the MEAC. You're coaching one of the one of our really good programs in HBCU baseball, and you're constantly at the top of our polls. And you're going out there, and you're every year since you've taken over the helm, you are getting national attention for your recruiting efforts. What are you doing that's coming into this season and you're and you're having to deal with because even through COVID, you still got one of the top recruiting classes in, in the, uh, Division I baseball. How has this uh, recruiting, especially the pandemic, affected your program? Yeah, thanks for the question, Michael. We, we've uh... – Obviously, COVID has impacted everybody, and it's 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 made us kind of really rethink as a coaching staff how we do things. And obviously, we we still have a job to do despite the challenges that we're in. And so, uh, really, for me, it's just in, empowering my assistants and and our staff to work as a team. Um, you know, especially in recruiting. Obviously, the development of your roster, the managing of the spots, the managing of the people that are in your organization, but um, you know, just uh, trying to do a good job of recruiting uh, the right pieces, the right kids, the right families, um, obviously the right talent, um, and not just, you know, throwing a wide cast net over kids, but specifically going after guys you've identified are, are truly good fits for our program. Well, Coach, you, you this year you, you're bringing back because the NCAA has, has, has allowed uh, – a second wave of eligibility because of the uh, pandemic. And your entire senior class is coming back, which is you're going to be playing uh, with some top-ranked teams. You're going to compete against some top-ranked teams. And you're doing it with your, it's a senior-led team who, had a, who made some noise a few years ago when you went to the regionals, and they're coming back. How is, what is it they're doing 
different than compared to uh, a few years ago when you actually won the conference and then you almost won that regional? Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a sense, we really aren't doing a whole lot different. Uh, you know, it's the same people. Um, you know, we have a specific plan that we go through throughout the year, and, it, and it's in phases that we're trying to accomplish, you know, from summer to start of school to um, fall period through winter break, and then obviously here in preseason spring. Um, you know, the neat thing about it, we talked about it, Michael, that's been a silver lining is obviously to have fourth and fifth year players back in your program who had every opportunity to move on and do something else, uh, you know, from the game and kind of kind of move on to grown up life. But those guys wanted that extra year. They want to play baseball. They want to be college athletes again. So uh, not a whole lot different. Just obviously the COVID adjustments have made things different for us, but uh, but still very, uh, very motivated on a daily basis to compete at a high level in practice and um, you know, continue to be great leaders within the program and, and continue to get prepared the right way. Coach, how you doing? AD Drew here, Black College Sports Network. Hey, AD. Uh, now, North Carolina a and over the past decade, probably has been known for its football program. Obviously, we know what mm -hmm. it is, has done uh, in the MEAC SWAC uh, in a celebration bowl, and we know how nationally prominent that your football program has been. Also, you don't have too bad of a basketball program there either. Last time I checked the standings, men right. and women. Now, how does baseball differentiate itself in a football school that football right. is number one? Basketball is clear. You're in North Carolina. We know basketball is up there as far That's as right. people's uh, interest in North Carolina. How do you tackle that as a baseball coach in, in, in a football school and a, at a basketball school? Right. Yeah, We well, um, when I first took over here, I, we always talked about it. It was going to take us a 1,000 days to turn the program around. And um, like every coach says, winning cures everything. And everybody wants to be associated and be around winners. And that's what we had to do. We first had to uh, get our culture right and get our uh, program in the right direction and then start producing a winner. And then when you win, start producing a consistent winner. And so, yes, we are, we are definitely a, a football, you know, revenue sport uh, centric program that, you know, that we love that. That helps us too. Uh, that helps us. Give, give our kids things to talk about when we're out in the recruiting trail. You know, it's, it's not all baseball either. It's a complete experience when our guys come to A&T. Um, but in a baseball sense, we talk about it. You know, the more we win, the more we go out and compete on a high level, get our brand out there in the, in the, in the baseball world. You know, we want to do everything we can to continue to convince people or let people know that this is a good baseball school. And we want to make it a baseball school. And, um, and we're the oldest intercollegiate sport on campus. Uh, baseball is the first sport at A&T that was played intercollegiately. So uh, the history, the tradition of our baseball program is, is definitely special. And, you know, it's just our jobs as coaches and our jobs as players to can you get out there and represent it the right way and, you know, make sure people see it and see it in the right light. Now, we all know this is your last go around in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. So... Kind of talk about that, the, the, that last go around, how special it may be, or maybe it's not special to you. Who knows uh, yeah. how, how you and your players feel about it. And then talk about that shift that you are making to the uh, Big South Conference for for the 22 season. Right, yeah. No, it's definitely special. I mean, you know, obviously the the connection to the MEAC Conference that our university and our athletic departments had is, is, is a unique um, – uh, experience and and obviously that's it's tough to go through and see some of the the alums and the the, the former players who who obviously the MEAC conference and 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 our, and our program gave them an awesome springboard to to what they do but um, we don't talk a lot about it right now because our, our goal right now is to go out and win a MEAC championship you know we we want to go out and compete uh, the last opportunity we had to win a championship you know we didn't win so. We've got a lot of motivation connected to what we're doing right now and to go out and, and be competitive day in and day out and, 
and you know finish our time here in the MEAC as, as MEAC champions. Um, you know, so uh, talking about the Big South is something more that that I'm doing with you guys and and different you know media outlets, things like that. Uh, it's not really something we talk about within the program right now, but um, in a short sense, it's exciting. It's just another opportunity for us moving forward. Uh, obviously in baseball, but as an athletic department as a whole, um, it's a challenging step. You know, I think we're ready for it as a program. Uh, we're definitely compete with those guys, you know, week in and week out, you know, in the midweeks and, and out of conference scheduling. But uh, but definitely excited for some of the things that, uh, that will begin to come our way uh, that the Big South offers our program, our kids, a, a little bit different platform and, and all the things that come with it, scheduling, uh, you know, media exposure, uh, televised games, and you know, all the different things that that, uh, that the Big South does. You know, definitely an exciting step for our program going forward. Coach Hall, this is Dr. Ville inside HBC Sports Lab. Uh, wanted to follow up, and I, and I know coaches, you're really in the moment. You focus on what's going on now, so I want to first say thank you. I hope you. You're your good. Your team family are safe. Uh, but Thank you. you did kind of touch on the Big South uh, as obviously you have the divisional alignment for the MEAC this year with North Carolina Central and FAMU. Um, with that mix up and wanting to get out of the conference with a championship this year. But I wanted to go a little bit in terms of recruiting. Um, as you obviously focus now in terms of the MEAC, that recruiting cycle for this class uh, has been in. You talked about the fact that the uh, NCA allowed seniors and juniors, obviously, to come back and provide some more leadership to the program. If you would allow me to kind of push you forward in terms of a little more in terms of the Big South, just from a recruiting perspective, do you feel that you right. have to recruit any differently in regards to more pitching arms? I know baseball programs are always looking for pitching uh, or type of uh, batting uh, programs that you're looking at, do, does that change any in terms of your overall philosophy? If not, tell me about right. your philosophy in terms of recruiting students for your program. Also, yeah. had to yeah. in a little bit. Um, everybody talking about the baseball and, and football program A and T, but it seems like A and T is winning in everything because track and field is up there as well. So uh, it just sounds like y'all have a winning culture. So take it away, coach. All that Aggie pride. Yeah, we really do. I mean, <laughs> yeah, just on that last question. We, we, we like we like to win around here. Uh, it comes from the top. At our athletic director, Earl Hilton, and our president, Chancellor Martin. I mean, they are they want to win in everything, and and they they've definitely given uh, been giving us and continue to give us the the things we need to be successful. And our coaching staffs on campus are it's impressive. You know, you see what what Dwayne Ross does with that, those track guys. I mean, you know, they they gonna have some kids running the Olympics this year. You know, it's it's just different, special. Um, so there's constant. Uh, it, I always tell our guys, if you can't motivate yourself, just look across campus. I'll motivate you <laughs> enough watching some of the other teams, you know, do what they're doing. But um, but to get to your recruiting question, um, you know, for uh, every sport's different, obviously. You know, baseball's got its own unique recruiting uh, requirements that you really have to kind of hit on to be successful. Um, you know, there's some sports that, that might say the Big South doesn't really affect what they do recruiting. You know, it. It, it, it's kind of a lateral step. You know, there's different, you know, uh, ins and outs to every sport. And it affects some sports a lot more and it affects some sports less. I, I definitely would say that, um, you know, that we've, we've recruited really well here and we've, we've battled those teams in recruiting already. And that's why we've been fortunate to turn our program around and to be a successful program right now. Uh, we've got a lot of kids in our program too, though, that were overlooked by those level of schools who have come here and developed into that type of player also. So um, I think the unique part about us is we're, we're very patient with our team. You know, we've got some kids that come here that aren't ready to play, but they develop. And then we've also got some kids that come in, you know, ready day one. And, you know, those guys, you, you have to beat good schools to get them. And um, you have to have the resources to attract those top level players also. But, um, you know, it, it all revolves around pitching. Like you said, if, if you don't have high-end, top-end pitching, and then you don't have depth that's usable depth, 
uh, it will get exposed in, in, in any conference. It, it gets exposed in the MEAC. Uh, but, but as we move up to, a, to the Big South, you know, and you look at where their depth is, um, that's things you got to continue to progress on. What's neat for us is, like I said, we've recruited hard. And um, if somebody told us we had to play the Big South schedule this year, I'd feel really good about it. We're, we're old and we're talented and we've got depth in the pitching staff. We've got depth positionally. So the biggest challenge, I think, long term now is just to make sure that we're uh, continuing certain spots on the field to identify that next level player. And, you know, when you when you get to a different conference that opens up new doors for you. And the question is, can we get the type of players in here that when we walk through that door and if that's a regional and then a super regional, you know, do you have the kind of players and the level of talent that are going to walk out and really be comfortable in those settings? Those are those that next level recruit that we want to access for sure. Thank you, Coach. It sounds like that Aggie pride is live and well. Really appreciate you taking us behind the scene in terms of answering those questions in regards to the yes, program. Sir. Continue uh, much success. Good luck this season and, and beyond. Thank you for your time, Coach. All right, we're going to let Michael Coker come back in and ask our final question of the, of the session for you, uh, Coach Hall. All right. Uh, Coach, Hall, Coach Hall, Mike Coker, Black College Nines. You're moving to the Big South. Now, the Big South has a – former program, baseball program, that actually won a national title. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to inject, North Carolina a is going to inject new blood into that conference. With that being said, uh, one of the things that when Coastal Carolina won that national title was they recruited heavy outside of that region. Would you be doing the same considering Florida is a hotbed? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, I, we're a state university in North Carolina, so it, it, it definitely starts and ends with our in-state players. We, we, uh, we, we were not doing a very good job when I first got here of recruiting uh, the better in-state in players. So that's obviously where our immediate focus always starts uh, in early recruiting when we first build in classes. But I'm a Florida guy. Um, I grew up in Florida, played in Florida. Uh, a lot of my connections are down there. And if you if you look at our roster, we've got kids from, from all over the place, from the Midwest to Florida to the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic uh, mid region. And uh, like any of the coaches in our in our athletic department would say, uh, A&T is a special place, and we want, you know, coast-to-coast -coast kids to have the opportunity if they fit what we're doing and can help push our program forward to have the opportunity to be an Aggie. So uh, Florida is definitely an important – piece are recruiting. Uh, I know just in the 21 class, we've got two really good high school players signed out of out of Florida, one out of Miami and one out of uh, Daytona Beach in Central Florida. Um, and some of our best players in years past have been junior college players out of the state of Florida. So uh, yes, to your question, our, our, our recruiting scope grows as you grow conferences. Um, your need to reach out and go wherever you have to go to find the best players uh, definitely becomes an important piece to, to what you want to do recruiting-wise. Thank you, Coach. Yes, sir. All right, Coach, uh, before we let, get out of here, I'm give you one last opportunity. Anything you want to say out there to all those Aggie Pride fans? Because we know how vocal they are, so we want to let them hear your voice <laughs> as we go out the door. Yeah, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. It feels so good to sit here and talk college baseball. I know it's been a long time. Our kids have all waited a long time. Michael, we've all been waiting to get back on the diamond. Uh, so uh, just really proud and happy that college baseball has made it through this thing safe and, and ready to get out and perform on the diamond, as I know you guys are excited to see. So uh, we just tell all our Aggies to – uh, to be safe and to make sure and, you know, and give these kids the credit they deserve. These guys have worked really hard and done everything they could possibly do to make sure they're ready to play and, and through this tough era we've been in. But, uh, but we're going to represent the interlock uh, to the highest degree, and we're going to get out there and compete with the best in the country. So thank you, guys. Coach, you put the product on the field, and Black College Nines will report it. Great to hear Stay safe out there, guys. You do All the right. same. That, that is Coach Ben Hall of the Black College Nine, number three ranked North Carolina A&T Aggies. Aggie pride.
now coming in coming up now is going to be coach Omar Johnson of the I love Jackson State University as uh, so we're waiting on coach Johnson to get his uh There we are. Hello, how you guys doing? Doing hey, fine, Coach, Coach Johnson. Uh, how, how you doing? Doing pretty well. All right, got got your iPhone kind of turned a little crooked there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and take my mask off there. Oh, uh, that that's good. Hey, we we like we like how you lead by example by having that mask on in this uh in this pandemic. We're trying to stay safe. Trying to keep everybody right. around us safe. So. Coach Jackson, Michael Coker with Black College Nines. How are you? I'm doing good. Coach Johnson, not Jackson. I'm, at Jackson I'm State. sorry. I'm sorry. I, I knew somebody was going to do it. Co 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 Coach Johnson from Jackson State. I was waiting on somebody to say Coach Jackson from Johnson State. I, you got you, you, you win the prize, Michael. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, it's not easy being me. <laughs> well, Coach Jackson State, I want to. Before I ask my question to you about your program, I want to commend you on what it is you're doing since you arrived on campus. And I report it all the time how this is, we're heading into, I think it's your 13th season where you've won 30 or more ball games. And that's something that does not get reported at the national level. Well, we do it. Black College Nines, we do it. We constantly mention it because. I'm a stats guy and I watch closely everything, but I want to commend you on your recruiting of the players and the players you put on the field so that you can win ball games. Because as a coach, that is a successful, that is a success rate. I appreciate that. We work hard at it. You know, it's, it's, it's recruiting is the name of the game. You can't do anything unless you recruit. You know, I like to think I'm a great coach, but I've been fortunate to get a lot of good players and have a lot of good assistant coaches. Well, so with that said, it. coming so into this, it. coming into the season, uh, you were ranked as a, a, a Black College Nine preseason number two. But you're you're always in fighting for that second and first spot in the conference. What is it you're doing different that's going to put you over the hump uh, for uh, 2021? Well, I, you know we. The with all the stuff that's been going on, we've just trying to get back to normal. I can't say doing much different. You know, I think we've proven over the years that what we're doing is working. Um, it's just getting some breaks in certain tournaments. You know, it's, we've, we've we've been really fortunate to to be able to get some of the players that that we've had and do some of the things. But you know, we're making adjustments with all the stuff that's going on around us. You know, we our our players weren't allowed to come back. Um, this fall. So we're just getting back with our players here at the beginning of January. So just trying to get back in the rhythm of things and kind of making some things happen. Has the pandemic slowed you down as far as getting your players back on the field? And if it has slowed you down, uh, coming into, in a few days you have a game, you're opening the season. And are you guys really prepared for uh, opening day, uh, February 19th? Well, as, as, as prepared as we can be with the, the limited time to, 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 to actually practice, you know, like I was just saying, we didn't meet as a club um, during the fall. Our players weren't allowed to come back to campus. So we just got back with our kids in January. But we've been working hard. The guys have really good attitude. We've been you know, trying to stay safe and trying to keep everybody together. So we're, we're getting prepared. I'm really excited about our group, and I'm really excited about the, the upcoming season. All right, Coach, uh, coming in now, we're going to have Charles Bishop of, H of the H Inside the Sports Lab and from the 1400 Club there in Jackson State. And then he will be followed by Keisha Kelly. How you doing, Coach Johnson? I'm doing pretty good. Hey, I wanted to ask a question in regards, and you talked about recruiting, uh, but especially with regards to the pitching depth. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, – the, the roster and especially what you uh, have with regards to arms at Jackson State now? 
Well, you know, we've been in such a unique situation in the past that we haven't been able to return our weekend pitching because of, you know, how we had junior college guys coming in. Actually, last year and this year, um, we were able to, to, to return two of our weekend starts. And that's been really rare. People don't realize that if you go back and look at our weekend pitchers, for the last five years, it's been a, a different um, set of guys. So to have the success after just doing that year after year is it's really – really a testament to those kids that we were putting in those spots. Um, but we have Nick Galatis and, and Anthony Becerra um, returning. And, you know, Nick and Anthony, they, they've done an outstanding job for us as long as they've been here. So we're, we're really excited about that. Um, at the back end of our bullpen, um, Stephen Davila, he's, you know, he's a guy that's going to close a lot of games for us. He started out with two early saves um, last year before everything was shut down. So, we're excited about that and some of the guys we've added to go along with those guys this year. Um, we, we have about 15 to 16 pitchers, so we'll, we'll go about four or five deep starting-wise and the rest of those guys are relievers or, or two closers. Uh, you mentioned not being able to uh, come back in the fall. you just kind of getting uh, the guys back for the spring semester. Has that uh, inhibited you in any way in terms of your preparation getting uh, ready for the season? Well, we were fortunate to be able to do some things via Zoom um, that really had it made us better coaches, you know, just by being creative and going through some of the, the individual stuff that we normally do in person. We were able to, we were able to do it via Zoom. I'm, I'm in the gym right now. We're throwing bullpens, by the way. So if I hear some background noise, that's what it is. That's good. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we, we got creative. I, I, you know, I, I'm really excited about um, getting these guys back, but what we were able to accomplish, now I, I have enough content to have my own YouTube channel. Now, I didn't, I didn't know because we videoed everything, we recorded everything. It, it, it made us have to become um, better coaches. Sure thing. Appreciate it, Coach. No problem. All right. I think uh, Keisha had a question. I didn't, but I can ask one. Right, feel free, because <laughs> I, I saw you come on camera earlier, so I assume you well, were trying it to... Well, it said it's said it's asking you to unmute your camera, and I'm like, wait, what did I do? But um, well, <laughs> what's this oh, weird? Yeah, you have the floor. <laughs> it, it's a, it's an honor with all these men. It's such an honor. So, Coach, let me ask you, and it's the same thing I, I asked uh, Coach Crenshaw from Southern. What, what, what is the student's uh, mental health like? You know, it's so much going on. The same question. What is the mental health like dealing with COVID, the scarcity on campus, the things of that nature? What is, what are their, what is their mental health like? What are they doing to just kind of maintain, to kind of keep the focus, to kind of not go into like a, I'm going to say depressive type state and like really like think about COVID as it stands right now? Actually, um, these guys are, are young baseball players, and the more opportunities they get out to play, the, the, the better they feel about things. Um, actually, the baseball is a, a great distraction from the rest of the stuff that's going on around them. So mental health, they're, they're, they're good. Um, believe it or not, they're, they're more excited now the closer the season gets, gets started. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's challenging times. Some of them couldn't wait to get back because of you know different locations throughout the country and outside of the country that some of the guys were. Um, so now, now they're here now. Everything seems to be pretty good with everyone. Thanks, Coach. Mm -hmm. All right, Coach. You know, uh, we got to get our uh, mandatory Coach Prime question in since we're talking to somebody from, from Jackson State. So, uh, and I know you probably get tired of this, but talk about the Prime effect on Jackson State and how does Jackson State baseball differentiate itself on that campus with everything that's going around around your your football program and oh by the way last time I checked you got some pretty good uh, basketball teams uh, go, playing right now also so talk about that for me coach well the the the, the exposure that um, coach Sanders is bringing to the the, the university is unbelievable you know, that, that's, that's a, I, we have a, a, a awesome fan base here at Jackson State. You know, they do a, a great job of supporting all our sports. Believe it or not, we'll have a Tuesday game in 45 degree weather and we'll look up in the stands and just about all of our seats are packed. 
So we, we you know, we're, we're, we can't say enough about our fan base. Um, but he's, he has a big following. He's a, you know, he's a very popular man. So, and he's bringing a lot of exposure. So they're, they're really excited. It's a big buzz around here uh, about the football team. And our basketball team, last time I checked, I thought they were in the first place in the conference. So they're doing really well, you know, now. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lot of excitement around the university right now. It's a really great place to be. You know, I've been here 15 years as the head coach, and I've seen it grow and consistently grow and consistently get better. This is, uh, I, you know, as a coach, you know, I'm from Miami and coming up here, I fell in love with the place as soon as I got here. So, you know, I can't say enough. But our baseball program, you know, I was hired by Coach Bradley. So I have a lot of loyalty to Coach Bradley. The baseball program was really good here way before I got here. Um, I am just was fortunate enough to, to come in and kind of continue some of the things that Coach Brady has, has done. Um, it, it's like a family around here, and we try to build on that. All right. Uh, my producer wants to know, what high school you went to in Miami since he's from the Miami area? I went to Miami High, but if he's from Miami, I, he'll understand this. I grew up on 22nd and 58th Street, Northwest. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, what we're gonna do now? We've got uh, gonna go with come with Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. He's gonna ask his questions, and then we'll go to Carlos Brown following Dr. Kenyatta Cavill. This is Dr. Cavill inside the HBCU Sports Lab. Good to have you, Coach. Hope all is well. Thank you for all that you're doing uh, for our institutions, particularly during this trying time. Appreciate with this. I want to talk a bit, a little more about the program uh, in terms of the success that you've had over the years, uh, in terms of your scheduling philosophy. I really like the way that you uh, introduce um, invitational game that you have at the beginning of the year that you bring different programs in from divisions that you don't necessarily play and then outside the conference uh, trying to bring in a MEAC or um, historically white college in terms of that uh, Platform. What was the importance of, of creating that classic platform? Why was that important for your program? It was, you know, when I when I first took over, we wasn't we weren't playing that many home games, and that was the issue. And 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 we wanted to find a way to get more home games. But you know, I, I started out coaching at University of North Alabama Division Two. You know, we had a chance to go to the College World Series, and you know, I always paid attention to how he scheduled over there and you know he 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 did a good job of, of scheduling games that put us in good situations to be competitive and I kind of kind of analyzed that and kind of basically followed his philosophy in doing that and it allowed us to have some teams come to our campus and play in our environment and have an opportunity to win games and you know I always talk about that you got to be competitive during the midweek you got to be competitive you just can't go out there and not put your best foot forward um, you know, every time you step on the field, you're representing the institution and the kids want to, you know, want to do well against some of the uh, outside competition. Next question I have is behind the coaching into your locker room as you're preparing uh, for a season or a particular game. I won't insult you in terms of asking you uh, who do you think is the best because I've seen you go at it and you certainly play for that perfection. But I would ask you from a fan's perspective, can you give us some insight? We have this discussion about the Western Division and the Eastern Division. Is there any real difference that you could talk about between the two difference in terms of the style? Is it a different style of play? Or is that just something more about the fans that we look at? I, 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 I would like to say it's, it's more with the fans um, because it's been years that I thought on the Western side, they had a couple of really good teams. And then it's been years that, that, that I, you know, it was one year Alabama and m had such a good team and they were kind of getting overlooked, um, but they didn't do so well in the tournament. And sometimes because the tournament has so much value in our league is that they had an outstanding regular season. Um, it gets kind of overlooked, but no, it, it's, it can be balanced. We have so many good teams that pop up, you know, everybody's more competitive than it, it used to be. You know, you think about, Mississippi Valley, you run across Mississippi Valley on the wrong day, they'll beat you, you know. So you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta respect everybody in the league, and it's consistently getting better when the institution's getting more resources. Um, baseball, baseball is always going to be, you know, just it's always going to be competitive in this conference. You just look at what the teams throughout the league do during the midweeks. The last question I have for you, Coach, and, and great points you make, and I really appreciate you uh, taking us inside that to give us that perspective. Now, 
looking a little past this, I know coaches, you focus on the here and now and appreciate that. I love hearing the bullpen back there and the guys getting it in. So I appreciate you giving us those sound effects. It really makes me hungry for some baseball. But with that said, I want to extend it a little bit, if you would. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, bringing in FAMU, Bethune Cookman for the conference? I know you've played them in week games and you've had a chance to even play them in series games, uh, certainly for FAMU. Uh, talk about that perspective, if you would, going forward, how that uh, potentially can elevate the conference overall. Well, I, I think it makes us more competitive baseball wise. Um, it, it definitely opens up Florida even more because, you know, I, I, I'm from Florida, but at the same time, right. I, I get a lot of kids from Florida. But now it's, it's, you know, it's a reference point. They can say, oh, Bethune's in that, that conference, or Florida and M's in that conference. Now right. uh, it's, a, it's a greater reference point to go out and recruit some of these guys. So, no, I, I think it's just it's a, it's a win win for the institutions and our conference. Thank you, Coach, for your time. Thank you for all you do. Stay safe. Appreciate it. Next up, uh, Carlos, did you still have a question? There we go. Good morning to you, Coach Omar. Appreciate the time. All right. Appreciate it. You mentioned about regular season and then the tournament play. Both are important, but why should there be more emphasis on the regular season championship? You know, if you ever go to the coaches association, the coaches recognize the regular season champion. They don't give you any trophies or awards for the tournament champion. Um, it's baseball. You know, anybody could be good for one weekend, but to be good for 14 weekends is a true test of a team. Um, but, you know, it's how the system is. You got to kind of play with, with, with you know, how the system works. You know what I mean? So if that tournament um, picks the, the representative, um, you just kind of have to live with it. But the regular season championship, I understand the, the, the RPI situation and all of that. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's an uphill battle when it comes to that. But, um, you know, we, we try to put as much emphasis on playing that regular season because we actually, you know, our mindset is trying to win every weekend we can. Right. I, I understand that. And with that being said, as far as how you was, you're scheduled for this year and in, in, in the future, would uh, you put more emphasis on uh, playing a, a tough midweek games and non-conference games? Your emphasis will still continue to be on that? Yes, we'll, 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 you know, this year is a little different because of so many cancellations. Um, right. But I think already next year, I think we have University of Chicago coming to our campus. You know, we, we, we got some teams that are going to come and play on our campus that, you know, that's going to give them an opportunity to get out of some tough weather and give them a little more exposure in the South. And then, you know, just, you know, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, our state is really good in baseball. So, you know, you got two top 10 teams in our state and then Southern Miss every year. Is, is, is one of the best teams in the country. Coach, uh, last question. Of course, a pandemic going on. Talk about leaning on your, your colleagues in, in, in the conference, fellow baseball coaches. How important uh, was it or is it to, uh, you know, fellowship with them and kind of see what they're going through, maybe perhaps you're going through? Well, we've been communicating a lot, believe it or not. I'm talking about every, every week with the coaches in the um, MLB tournament, and Andre Dawson, and then our regular conference calls with our conference coaches. So we, we've communicated a lot. Everybody's dealing with their certain issues, and we're trying to figure out, well, we, we figured out how the testing protocol is going to go. And, and you know, right now we're, we're in this winter storm right now, and it's wreaking havoc down here. You know, it's, I've, I've been in Jackson a long time. I've never seen it, um, the ice on the roads like, like it is now. So, you know, it's a challenging time, but, you know, everybody's going to have to be a little flexible, and we kind of have this – model that we're all in this together, so we're going to try to make the best decisions for the group instead of the individual institution. Thanks, Coach. Continue to be safe, you and the program and your fellow coaches, students. All right. Thank you. All right, Carlos, we want to thank you for your question. Um, Coach Johnson, we're going to give you the last word if you'd like to say anything to the faithful here. Uh, the, 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 as they say it, the faithful. And just to let you know, I am that producer he was referring to. I'm a graduate of Miami Jackson. 
senior okay. high school. I grew up about five or seven blocks away from Miami High. Okay, all right. My mom went to Northwestern, so that'll, that'll give you a little <laughs> rivalry right there. <laughs> but um, no, um, it, it's appreciate you guys for having me. Um, and 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 it, the more exposure for for the HBCU baseball programs, the better. You know, uh, I think all of us is kind of like uh, that secret that no one really knows about until they kind of see us play. It's exciting baseball. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this year and really happy for you guys to have us. The I love. All right. And with that, Coach Johnson, thank you. We will be back with more in our number one team right after this break. Yeah. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dashboard, as well as the upcoming week of HBCU sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Watts and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. It was a, a monumental game for a and and Tampa. It was a monumental game. Somebody had to lose, and thank God it was them this time. We knew it was going to be a battle. Look at Jake Avis' record. 202 and 36, I think. Some, some un, off the wall figures. And nobody would play him because they didn't want to take a chance of getting beat. But the truth of it is, over 46,000 tickets. Blacks were sitting on in, in the East stands, the whites were sitting in the West stands, and the score wound up 34-28. Uh, the only thing we proved that uh, we weren't inferior, that we were not inferior, and we were not afraid. For one night, for 160 minutes, we were better than them. This is Ryan Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. The Cuvée Group. I mean, I could do it. It's no problem. We're back. We're back on uh, HBCU uh, Black College Baseball Media Roundup. Quickly going back down the top 10. Number 10, Prairie View. Number 9, Alcorn. Number 8, North Carolina Central. Number 7, Florida A&M University. Number 6, Grambling. Number 5, Southern. Number 4, Texas Southern. Number three, North Carolina A&T. Number two, Jackson State. And now, drum roll, please. It's time for our number one team, according to Black College Nines, Alabama State University, Coach Jose Varquez. Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you do the brief introduction to bring Coach on. Coach Varquez. Michael Coker with Black College Nines. Eh, como pa fue? Oh, wait, hold on a second. That's my, my bus. Coach, let's get you to unmute yourself now. Coach, Mike Coker with Black yeah. College Nines. Eh, eh como te fue? Todo bien. Good morning, everybody. Actually, good afternoon. How are we doing? Bueno, está bien. Okay, okay. <laughs> Coach. <laughs> Coach. Yes, sir. Defending national champion. Uh-huh. <laughs> it feels good, right? <laughs> two times back-to-back -back national champions. This past 2020 season, in the pandemic, shortened season, 14 and 4, and you were projected to win 40 ball games. Okay. You come back in 2021 <laughs> with the same roster. What's so different about your roster is, like everybody else, they brought back seniors for an additional year. You did not. <laughs> Why is that so? And 
it is it's it has you ranked and then you're being talked of in other uh, uh national publications as well a as a point you were voted in the national collegiate baseball writers poll as receiving votes you, you've t you've taken over that that culture you were uh, one of the coaches with uh Melinda Melendez and who built the powerhouse <laughs> you were a part of that powerhouse at Bethune you followed him to Alabama State, and now you're at the helm of Alabama State. And then you are still, and this is something that people don't realize, that you are that main cog of recruits coming out of Puerto Rico. What are you doing, and how are you elevating your program? Well, thank you, first of all. You know, I, I appreciate that. We we just, um, I think this speaks a lot of how um, really – our university, what our university has done to us to for and for this baseball program, for us to be able to have the best um, things in general. You know, I'm talking about from the facilities uh, standpoint, from the way we travel, from uh, everything that we offer academically. You know, it's a combination, and, and the credit goes to Alabama State. Um, you know, we do have. A lot of connections, you know, throughout this uh, the nation. I do have the the connection, yes, from from Puerto Rico, being you know that I'm from there. But you know what, we have a uh, good players from all over the the nation, and that's something that we feel very proud of. And we feel that our our brand, the Alabama State uh, brand, has grown, and I think it's going to continue to grow. And you know, we feel good about the product that we're putting out there every year in and, and year out. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's humbling to be in this situation we, with uh, a roster that is, uh, is back uh, from weekend starters to basically the starting lineup and the addition to, of, of, of some younger guys that are very talented. And just being able to, to think about that and, and fit, you know, it's a good feeling that we, that we feel we're going to be able to compete in every game that we uh, – that we have on the on the schedule. Well, Perfect Game rated your recruiting as one of the top 75 across the nation. And that's a pretty good number considering there are more than 300 Division I baseball programs. Mm -hmm. How are you able to get the kids to come in, into being a Hornet? Well, oh, I got good. I got good people. I got two good recruiters. I have a, an associate coach and a, a, a recruiting coordinator, Drew Clark, and I got my my pitching coach, uh, Matt Crane. You know, when you become the head coach, even though recruiting was my my main background, you know, you uh you deal with so many things as a head coach, and and I have uh a uh, hundred percent confidence in the in the job that those two guys do for for this program. So, I mean, I, I am involved in the recruiting uh, process. Uh, obviously, it's one one area that I will never, uh, you know, I guess uh, go away from. But I got I got good people. I got good uh, evaluators. Uh, they they do an excellent job, and they know what we need for us to continue to to keep this program uh, at the caliber that we are right now. And and that's really the key for for the success when it comes to recruiting. It's a combined effort. So, you know, we, it's one of those things that we talk about it every day. We talk about recruiting every day and, and we continue to identify the players that can come in here and, and keep the program, you know, running smoothly. Well, how has the uh, pandemic helped or hurt our recruiting? Because uh, there are major changes across the board. Um, kudos to the NCAA for understanding that and granting an additional year when they just could have moved forward. But with that being said, how has uh, the pandemic uh, helped your recruiting? What is it, what has it changed? Has it changed your mindset any at, or, or at all? Well, and uh, I'm gonna answer it differently because I think it helped us in a way, very, it's a unique way that it helped us. Uh, we were able to have a few guys that are on campus right now uh, that we were able to get in here because of the shortening of the baseball draft. And in, in a typical year, those guys would have probably gotten drafted later 
in the second day and, and chosen to, uh, to go professionally. This year, we were able to land three guys, like I said, we, that, we, that ended up on campus uh, that didn't get drafted, and, and they're here with us, and definitely, you know, they're making our program better. Uh, and the, the part that it, it's hurt us a little bit is because, you know, we, we have everybody back. So it really, I don't know, I don't know if, it's, uh, if it's hurt us or it's hurt the players, you know, this, uh, the 2021 uh, kids that are very good players that can play at, the, at this level. But, you know, I'll just give you an example. This, this year, 2020, was the first year in my 19-year career that we didn't sign anybody in the, in the early signing period. Uh, because, you know, we have a relatively young uh, ball club uh, with only this club right now is losing just three guys after this year. Everybody will be back again next year. So, you know, that's, uh, that's been the, the crazy thing about the, the pandemic. And it, I think it, it has benefited us and has also, you know, put us in a situation that we're focusing more probably in 2022, 2023 class, which uh, not the norm for us. We typically go year by year, maybe a year and a, a year ahead, you know, 2022. But that's what happened in the 2020 or with the 2021 class because we have so many guys coming back and, you know, we have a, a roster really that's pretty full. All right, Coach, how you doing? A.D. Drew, Black College Sports Network. Yes, sir, doing good. All right. Uh, <laughs> and don't don't hold this against me. I'm a, I'm a Tuskegee grad, so. All right. <laughs> I, like, I like Alabama State except for one day a year. I got you. I got you. All right. But seriously, though, something that I've heard a lot of coaches say throughout these interviews today is a phrase they've used as weekend arms or uh, weekend, weekend pitchers. Mm -hmm. for, for the layman out there, kind of explain what that is, number one. And then number two, explain your philosophy as you put your pitching staff together for a typical college season. And, and I, I know I might get a long way because I'm only going to get this one question in. Number three, do you still look at pitchers only? Or do you look at some pit, some players that could be pitchers and uh, play positions also as you start putting that pitching staff together? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, the first part of your question, we, we definitely, when you talk about uh, pitchers that are your weekend arms, the guys that are going to, you know, pitch Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, those are the guys, that, the best way to explain it, those are the guys that as you go through the season, you project for those guys to pitch the most of the innings. Those are the guys that as you went through the fall or in preparation for your season, you identify those guys as, as the ones that when, you know, when you get between the lines, those are the guys that are going to give you the best shot to, uh, to win ball games. Um, how do you uh, put a, a weekend uh, starting rotation? You know, you, we in the past have done it different ways. You know, we have gone with uh, younger guys, guys that are out of high school. And, you know, we feel that they can compete for us and they got good stuff. And you really, in, in a way, you, you throw them under the fire uh, and say, you know what, we, we need to see what you can do for us. And that has worked in the past. This past year and in this year coming in that, that uh, basically the rotation is scheduled to be the same, we went a, in a different route, which we had three starters uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that were junior college arms, you know, and, and obviously that brings the experience guys that have done it in the past. And we were able to, to have, you know, good start of the season by those guys leading the way, you know, with, a, for example, a Jack Nell Guzman, which uh, by, the, by the time the season got canceled, he was leading the nation in complete games. Uh, Breon Pooler, uh, my Saturday uh, starter, which, uh, I think his ERA was uh, 0.57 or something like that. I really can't recall. And then an Austin King, that another junior college guy that that was uh, or is a competitor and was doing an excellent job for us on the weekend. You can uh, you can go wrong with that experience at the Division One level. You know, like I said, we've done it different ways. We've done it with freshmen. We've done it with junior college guys. But this particular year, this past year, was with junior college guys leading the way. Um, the other part of the question, I know there was three parts. I'm sorry. What was the uh, last part? Do you still, do you recruit pitches only or do you yes. recruit 
is well, that you know what? We're, play, we're, we're playing the field also. We're, we're unique. You know, we feel that when you can find somebody that can pitch and also play a position, you're really getting two players uh, under just one scholarship. So we are for that. As a matter of fact, right now, we have three guys in our roster that are pitchers and position players. Uh, one, you know, they, they're relievers, but we have three guys that do an excellent job for us. And we're counting on, on them, you know, pitching some important innings for us. But, yeah, we, if, we do believe that if you can do it, you know, the workload is going to be a little um, heavier, I guess, and the throwing, they're going to do a lot of throwing. But we do believe in two-way guys, and, and we definitely allow them to, to you know, do that for us at, at Alabama State. All right. And I'm pretty sure you leave them as two-way guys because they probably got a pretty good stick also to help you out in the lineup also. Absolutely. One of, one of them right now is, uh, is uh, Trenton Jamison, which is actually going to play third for, for us and, and hit third in the lineup. And he's also going to be a reliever, uh, you know, uh, as well. So, and it's uh, Trevor Djurjevic, uh did it last year, pitched for us about six, seven innings. That's another guy that uh, in four innings and gave us a chance every time he, he, he competed, competed and also played third base. So, I mean, we, once again, if we, if they can do it, we're definitely for that. All right, Coach, before we let you get out of here, I'm going to see if Michael has one more question and I, I need to make an announcement really quick. I believe we have uh, Coach Robertson from Texas Southern on the phone. So, Coach, if you can just hold off until we get finished here with Coach with the last question, then we will roll back around to pick you up. Uh, he is in that Houston area where the storms are very bad for folks, so we want to make sure we give him an opportunity to get in. But, Michael, did you have a, a final question for Coach Vasquez? Yes. Coach Vasquez, you know that you have a target on your back. You know as a defending champion, teams are going to gun for you. You know that that season, uh, 14 and 4, what is a 40 win season? You are very much aware of Alabama State's history in the last 10 years. What are you going to do different to elevate yourself as to where you can, at the end of the poll next year, that maybe, or you're giving that chance to defend your crown? What are we going to do differently? I'm not planning to do many things differently. We're just one thing that we're going to do is actually try to be consistent with everything that that we do. We're gonna we're gonna try to uh, to throw strikes. We're gonna try to play with the the same passion and the same intensity that we that has really been the the key to to our program. Uh, we know that um, that our name and and we know that people respect. Alabama State, not only in the Southeast, but uh, but nationally. We're well aware of that. And we have a lot of respect for everybody that we play. Uh, you know, one thing that I that I tell our guys is that we respect everybody, but we fear nobody. So we're just going to, you know, we feel that we're just going to go and, and do what we do, which is try to live in the moment, you know, uh, compete every time that we step on the field. Uh, we have the players, we have the personnel. I feel that our philosophy it's one that is going to, you know, can get us to to be in every game that we play. But I don't plan to do too many things differently. You know, we're just going to try to, you know, not let our highs get too high and our lows get too low. We're just going to continue to work hard. We're going to continue to to take it game by game. And we got to, especially in a year like this year, we need to understand that that uh, getting to play baseball is, uh, is a blessing. And I know all these guys are – are excited to to be able to get back on the field and and really that's that's uh, the plan for this year. Not too many things different. We're just trying to be consistent with everything that we do. All right, and coach. Uh, any any final you. statement on Hornets Nation before we let you go? Well, we once again we we feel pretty good about this club. I mean, as uh, whatever we were able to accomplish last year, it was it was good while it happened. But you know, it's a, it's a new year. Uh, we have not done anything yet. We, even though the the team is the the roster is the same roster, we just once again we're going to approach it with with uh, the hunger, you know, that we had when we started last year. We uh, one thing that I keep preaching our guys is that we have to be a 
uh, the team that, that that it was last year's team when it comes to the chemistry that we have. You know, we had good players. They know that they're good players. I know that they can compete. But if we don't stay together and we have the chemistry that we had last year, you know, I think that's what really got us over the the hump to be able to to finish with, like I said, a 14-4 and four, uh, record uh, at that time. It's because we were getting along really good. Yes, we found ways to win. And the guys will continue to work hard and, and everybody was pulling for each other. So everybody out, out there, especially our ASU fans, thank you for for your support. I, you know, we're going to continue to do our best to make you proud. And once again, we're very thankful for our university, our administration. And, you know, we're very proud to to be here. And, you know, hopefully you guys can continue to to see how our program continues to represent the university and and uh, hopefully climb new new heights in the 2021 season. You come right, thank, you. thank you, Coach. Uh, Coach Jose Vasquez, the number one ranked team in, uh, according to Black College Nines. Congratulations on that. Good, good, good luck with that target on your back this year. We thank you for your time, Coach. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. And well, it looks like we're getting ready to go into extra innings using a baseball analogy because now, uh, of course, we, we know what's going on in Texas and throughout a lot of the nation, uh, power outages, snow, ice, whatever. But from Texas Southern University, here for, for some extra innings, Coach Michael Robertson. Uh, Coach, uh, Coach, are you there? Could you unmute him? Yeah. If you're on your phone, you may have to hit star six, coach, in order to unmute yourself. Drew, let's do this. We're going to take us a quick break and get coach in. So we'll He's be right in. back. With more. He's, He's in. here. He's, He's in. here, Roy. I, I got you. We still, there's a couple of things we need to take care of really quick. So we, now that we got him in, but we'll be right back after this quick break. All right. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. This is the Dean of the College of HBCU Sports, Kenyatta Cavill of Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Come mix it up in the lab where the course lecture is in session every Tuesday from 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker, or the BCSN app. As we discuss all things about the HBCU sports culture, including exploring the week that was in the sporting HBCU dashboard as well as the upcoming week of HBCU Sports. With me, the Dean, the College of HBCU Sports, on Dr. Cavill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Course lecture dismissed. It was a, a monumental game for a and and Tampa. It was a monumental game. Somebody had to lose, and thank God, it was them this time. We knew it was gonna be a battle. Look at Jake Avis' record. 202 and 36, I think, some some un, off the wall figures. And nobody would play him because they didn't want to take a chance of getting beat. But the truth of it is, over 46,000 tickets. Blacks were sitting on in, in the East stands. Whites were sitting in the West stands. And the score wound up 34-28. Uh, the only thing we proved that uh, we wasn't inferior, that we were not inferior, and we were not afraid. For one night, for 160 minutes, we were better than them. This is Brian Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCA. We're back here. Extra innings, fellas. Get those arms loose. Uh, joining us now is Coach Michael Robertson of Texas Southern. Uh, he does not have video because of the situation that's going on down there in Texas. So we, got, we he was able to join us via, via cell phone. So, Coach, I'm going to start off with this. First of all, Hope everything is going well uh, with you, your family, and your extended family, that being your team. Uh, if, if you would, Coach, please just kind of tell us how, how everything has been going for the last day or two for you guys down there in your neck of the woods. 
Um, uh, just really rough, been a trying time, uh, trying to, uh, really just keep up with our student athletes because, uh, you know, everything going on with, you know, being affected by the winter storm and, um, you know, a, a large part of Houston is without power. And, uh, you know, of course our first concern right now is our student athletes besides from, you know, our family. Uh, themselves, of course, but uh, just making sure that student athletes are, you know, in a place where they're safe and got some shelter, food, water, et cetera. So it's, it's been uh, pretty rough the last couple of days. Yeah. So, so how does this affect any work that you have done to do, you know, during your preseason to get you to this point? Obviously, you're probably going to lose a week right here. So how does this affect you, you think, going forward with with your season? Well, um, you know, our first opponent is University of Houston. So, you know, I, I would tell you that they're dealing with the same situation we are. I think the biggest thing right now, um, and also that Todd is probably concerned with, is, this, you know, the welfare of the student athletes. And, of course, before we able to get on the field and play, <clears throat> we have to be tested also. So that's, that's you know, a couple of concerns that we got uh, ahead of us besides the weather. I think the weather, excuse me, <clears throat> I think the weather is going to be on, on our side sometime probably uh, on early as Friday uh, evening and certainly for the weekend. Uh, so, you know, we were able to get uh, probably a couple weeks of, you know, practice in and then, of course, you know, we've been dealing with COVID-19, you know, kids uh, being in and out. And we had a few kids that probably half of the team that had to quarantine uh, probably about, uh, probably about, yeah, a week and a half ago. So we were able to get probably two or three practices, you know, four practices in with the whole team uh, prior to, you know, the storm. So, um, again, and Universal Houston, they, they've been affected by it too as well. So. Really no excuse. You know, once we get on the field, uh, we still expect our kids to be able to execute the plan. And that's, you know, good pitching, good defense, and timely hitting. All right. Last question I have for you before I turn it over. Uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic. And you've got power outages and everything else. You know, normally when the lights go out, you find somebody's house or some part of town where – you know, who has electricity and heat and everybody just bunches up in that house, sleep on the couch, sleep on the floor and do whatever right. in order to survive. Right. This this right. brings such a unique aspect to it because you got, you got a social distance, but you may right. not be able to realistically social distance given the, given the right. uh, circumstances because if, if it's staying warm or catching COVID, unfortunately, some people may make their choice of staying warm and potentially exposing themselves to somebody uh, who may be, you know, may be a potential carrier. So what has just dealing with that been like on top of everything else? Yeah, been very difficult. You know, that's, that's uh, we crossed that road too when we first went into this because prior to, you know, the winter storm, I was, you know, preaching to the team and I told the coaching staff to control the controllable and, uh, you know, once you get out of practice, you know, grocery store, or, you know, get you, you know, go get you something to eat and then hunker down, you know, head straight to your, you know, place to stay and don't do anything stupid. But uh, with all the uh, adversities that we've been dealing with, of course, you know, the kids from Houston and particularly our team, they, they've been trying to, I've been preaching to them. You know, hey, let's just try to cover each other. If somebody have some power, can get to some power where you are water or shelter, uh, let's find that location and see if we can get there safely. And so with that being said, then, you know, some of my kids had to go uh, to some of the Houston, the kids from Houston uh, house. And um, so you don't really know what they're going to deal with inside there in terms of, you know, if, if the person that could be a parent or, could be a girlfriend or whatever if they've been tested. So um, those are things that we have to deal with. So it's kind of out of our hand because, you know, we're concerned with their safety also. And they, they have to get to a place where they're safe and got some water and food, et cetera.
right. Uh, I'm going to let Dr. Cavill uh, go next. Uh, I've talked enough about COVID and the storm. Maybe see if we, if either Dr. Cavill or Michael can get a baseball question in now. <laughs> Certainly. I'm going I'm to go a little bit in terms of the baseball memory lanes because uh, Coach, I go back, you know, Ryan tries to claim that he's the one that recruited him to Prairie View, but I thought it was myself going out and watching Coach as he uh, legendary took a high school program, um, literally an inner city program to um, the Final Four in the state of Texas. I told you earlier, baseball is big. Coach Robinson uh, was uh, responsible for that in terms of what he got done. And then coming to Prairie View, literally revitalizing that program, uh, bringing it to national prominence uh, with uh, SWAC championships. And at that time, the only teams winning in the SWAC were Southern, Grambling, uh, in Jackson State, and most recently it was just all Southern, and he had some clashes with Southern with Coach Kador that are still in, in my memory that I just can't erase. Then he gets a chance to come over to the rival school at Texas Southern University. They had won some uh, tournament championships, uh, and then he comes over there and he does it again. So this is a program building. This is an individual uh, that I think needs to be said in regards to finding ways to get it done. Um, he rebuilt the program, as I said, with Prairie View. Now it has uh, some of the best facilities um, mm -hmm. literally in the conference. And then he comes to Texas Southern, and he's playing in the city park and still gets it done. Went head-to-head -head to Rice University in the tournament. Chopped him down. Was that close? I say it was a bogus call. Coach don't have to say that because you're still in the game, Coach. I, I was in the <laughs> press box when that happened, so I'll take the bullets that one for you. But enough of that. Your team um, has come back at Texas Southern University, uh, plays at a very high level. And I just want to get some insight in terms of how you go into a tournament and you find yourself in that final days of seeking a championship, regardless of where you're at, you're able to get that done. Tell us a little bit about your recruiting philosophy. Has it changed from Prairie to Texas Southern? And then just emotionally, what you're able to do to get your kids to play at such a high level. Yeah, you 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 said a mouthful. You brought back some really good memories. And, you know, one thing I can associate with is, you know, you don't do it without the help and support of some really, you know, key people. One is, you know, of course, the student athletes and uh, two is the assistant coaches and, and three is just the whole, you know, administration, um, even dating back to Forrest Brook when we did some really miraculous things back then. Those are some, you know, we, we were up against a lot of adversity um, throughout that whole process. And um, coming to Prairie View and m University, you're exactly right. I can remember those days like it was yesterday, uh, taking over uh, – uh, three and 418 the year before I got there and the first year we were 10 and 48 and then the rest was history I think we played in full straight championships uh, back to back uh, champions back to back western division champions and back then you know it was unheard of to even beat southern in one game let alone you know two games southern was just really 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 good I don't know if the rest of you guys on were back then to remember Southern back in those days when Ricky Weeks played there. So that just oh, tells you the magnitude of the yeah, of Prairie View, the takeover at Prairie View, because that's basically what we were able to do. And so I give a lot of credit to, um, you know, Dr. McClellan, you know, first of all, because he provided us with a lot of resources. And then the whole Prairie View and m University um, community, because, um, I always tell a lot of people, you know, we were fortunate to get uh, just a, a bunch of support there at Prairie View, and it, it made for a, a really, really good feel-good story those six years that I was there. And then coming to Texas Southern University, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a different, you know, situation because, you know, you're in the heart of Houston, and um, you tend to attract a lot of attention and stuff. And it's very competitive here from a recruiting standpoint. Um, to just winning on campus because, you know, you have so many good programs on campus. You're competing against the, the men basketball team, the women basketball team, and, the, you know, the softball team. They've been very, very good throughout uh, at least my tenure at, at Texas Southern. So 
um, a, a bit of a, you know, different angle. Um, but what we always try to do from my standpoint uh, in terms of recruiting is, you know, we, we try to get the OKG and the OKG is our kind of guys. You know, those are guys that we're trying to recruit, the guys that will understand the culture, you know, the culture that, uh, that exists in our, you know, especially at Texas Southern, just the language, you know, the language, the way that we, you know, want to go out and play and stuff. Of course, you know, myself, I have a lot of history of, of coaching, you know, athletes, kids with great athleticism. So, you know, the way we go out and recruit opposition players, you know, is no different than Arkansas and some of the other Power 5 schools. We'll go out and try to find our shortstops. And once we get them in, you know, we figure they can play center field, first base, um, catching, you know, wherever. That's kind of the way, you know, we, we've done things at, at Texas Southern. Of course, it has got our way. It's, I can remember – um, us putting together, you know, some really good roster of kids that we actually, you know, didn't even recruit. You know, the guys that we were recruiting, we never really got them at Texas Southern. We just ended up getting some guys, I guess you would call journeymen, that just wanted an opportunity to go play because nobody else wanted them to, to, you know, didn't feel like they could play in their program. So uh, at that point, we were kind of feeling them, hey, you know, you need to come here because there's an opportunity to show them what you can do. So. That's part of our reason behind playing the, the big schedule that we play, which is very competitive, and we've been doing it now for over five years. We're a little bit unique than other programs. I think Alabama State, you know, I, I'll say they go out and they, you know, try to put a, a formidable schedule in front of them. But if you look back at it, Texas Southern have played uh, one of the most difficult schedules of any HBCU program for probably the last five or six years. And, you know, the only thing we're concerned with at Texas Southern is, you know, what goes on in May. You know, from the day we start, uh, you know, our championship campaign in the fall, you know, everything is, you know, about May. We're just getting for May for the postseason. You know, strength conditioning at 6 o'clock in the morning, the grueling practice at McGregor Park, um, all the days in the cages, uh, that big schedule in front of you is just really getting you ready for May because we feel that if we don't have championship season and we didn't have a successful season, even if we win the Western Division, it don't mean a whole lot at Texas Southern University. Um, it's just really important that we uh, capture championship. Great point there. Follow up question, and then I'll, I'll share it with everybody else. Um, as, as you talk about uh, the support you got at Prairie View and certainly the support you got with Charles and bringing you over, I was digging in the crates and I saw that back-to-back -back baseball championship that I was able to get for the team. So they brought back great memories on that. Uh, but when I came to Texas Southern, you know, financially you're doing well, you wouldn't even let me write, you wouldn't even take my checks over there in Texas Southern to continue to support you. But I understand, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would pause on that. With that being said, Coach, uh, want to talk, give us some highlights on some of the players that we can expect to uh, look out for this year. Um, well, we got a litany of players. You know, I I, I don't want to jinx myself because you know I, you know, we, we basically have the same team that we had last year, but with more pitching, more pitching, and then more depth on the bench. So you know, this has really been um, one of the um, I would say most interesting roster that I've had in a few years, and being that we're young. We were able to go out and uh, fill the roster with um, a couple of JUCO kids and definitely uh, some arms. So, of course, the biggest you know addition is the Cam Field kid, Cam Fields kid from University of Texas. Of course, we expect for him to log a lot of innings in for us. Um, a, a couple other guys, you know, that you're going to see on the on the uh, on the bump will be uh, uh, Bryson Armstrong, is a kid that we recruited from Oklahoma. Uh, he'll probably be uh, the guy that we uh, try to finish games with this year. Um, Jacob Moran, a kid that's returning from uh, last year's team, and and you know we're really excited about um, what he can do on the mile for us. Uh, he's one of those kids that, that gets tremendous spin rate on his breaking ball, and we feel like we can run him out there against pretty much any team in the country. If he's on, he he always have a a chance to. Um, at least keep us in the ball game. Then, of course, 
uh, we got a litany of guys that we could go to this time around in the bullpen and hand it off to. So nothing yet is set in stone. We're still trying to, you know, find out who can do what other than, the, you know, scrimmage competition that we've had against each other. Um, some other big names, you know, you're probably, you know, going to want to know about is Roger Coffey, the kid that had the uh, tremendous year last year. He was, of course, Roger was a mm-hmm. freshman. Um, and he was a freshman All-America uh, last year. So, uh, you know, he's a kid to watch. Uh, Oscar Ponce, uh, he put up some incredible numbers last year in a short season. Um, another kid, uh, interesting, number two, is uh, Gene Salazar. He's a big kid, uh, and he'll be hitting probably fourth in the lineup. Uh, he has the capability to knock the wall down as well. So, and then, of course, our core guys are our two guys in the middle, Justin Cooper and Tyrese Claiborne, who I, I just love those two because, um, you know, you know what you're going to get from them each and every day. Since I first laid eyes on them and they've been at Texas Southern, they where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there, and doing what they're supposed to do. And usually if you're doing that, then you're okay with Coach Rob. So um, they're definitely our core guys. Um, and then we got some other guys that that's interesting. We're definitely going to be uh, very athletic uh, this time around. We'll be able to um, get back to our, you know, philosophy, you know, which is to run. You know, that's what we've always tried to do at Texas Southern is run and uh, be able to play off of our short game and uh, try to open things up from there. Thank All right, you. Coach. Thank you. Uh, uh, very- Ed, it sounds like you're loaded in so many day in so many ways. Stay safe and thank you for your time. Just wanted to say, continue to do what you do against those Big 12 teams as you bring home a lot of those victories, playing so many tough teams. And it looks like the team is loaded for bear and ready to go this season. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Appreciate it. Michael. We've got uh, we are an extra inning, so we've probably got time for one question. So uh, if you would go ahead, Michael. Coach, I've always talked about how you finish the season. Uh, you and I have discussed many a times, and I would like for you to share, if you may, or if you are willing to share, how is it that – and I've always said this. If I know college baseball does not play 100 games, but if they played 100 games, the, at the first half of the season, you would go 25 and 25. And then the second half, you'd go 49 and 1. What is it that you do different in the second half that propels – uh, Texas Southern, and you just start knocking everybody off. I, I, I think it's just the system. You know, uh, um, the biggest thing, you know, where I'm at is, you know, I always say that it's, it's not the coaches, it's not the players uh, that's producing championships and, um, you know, a large part in what we're doing on the, um, in terms of being successful. It's our system. And um, I always just try to remind the kids and the coaching staff and everything, whether we fail or not, just trust in the system, trust in the process. You know, we stick to it and it's going to happen. Maybe not right now, but eventually it will, you know. So that's something that we preach day in and day out with the kids is, you know, focus on the process and not results. The results will come later. Uh, I can tell you this, a, a big part of everything that I've ever – you know, um, that I really believe in since I've been coaching is just discipline, just having, you know, just good old hard discipline. You know, we still one of those programs that believe in coaching our kids hard. We still one of those programs that believe in running. And we still one of those programs that believe in getting up at six o'clock in the morning and doing everything like you're on fire. So those things have, haven't changed. And I think, you know, large in part, that's a big part of our success is because, of the way that we just do things, the way the culture has been in all of the programs that I've ever been part of and getting the kids to buy into it. Thank you for that, Coach. And stay safe. Mike, Mike you got anything else? Thank you. I know you had a question about that one young man from Texas earlier. Yeah, I did. I kind of – I don't know why I went north with that when I should have stayed south, but – that, that that's a big statement in the young man that came in from Texas. Uh, it, it, he didn't make a statement per se, but his his choosing to continue his baseball career, his fifth year, and come to Texas Southern. How big is that for you? That's a big arm. Yeah, it, it's not only a big arm uh, for us, but uh, you know it gives us the leadership 
that I felt like we needed on our pitching staff because our pitching staff was was very young last year, and I felt like we they really didn't have you know that one guy to look up to because you know we brought in a, a you know a group of JUCO kids and they you know usually the first time around you're trying to you know learn the culture you're trying to find the TSU way and usually that get it the second you know by the second year you got it you know so um, but with uh, Cam um, he's one of those kids that that's even better he's a better person than he is a ball player. And, you know, Cam is, is an extraordinary athlete. And um, the thing about it I think a lot of people don't know is, is this kid has only been pitching for four years. So wow. he's still learning a lot about pitching in itself. You know, when he got to us, he really didn't have a lot of weapons to go along with that 94, 95-mile-an-hour fastball. So, you know, he, he's a very quick learner. We're trying to work with him. Uh, diligently on getting some weapons to go with that 94, 95 mile an hour fastball. So, so it will work, you know, so, you know, so it's, it's a lot of um, information that has been, um, you know, thrust upon him and he's a quick learner. So I'm excited to have him, but like I say, not only, um, we're not only expecting him to go out and to perform well, but also to be a leader in the community um, on the baseball field, in the dugouts, in the weight room, everything. He brings it. He's, he's really, really, really a solid kid. Very solid kid. Solid individual. All right, Thank Coach. You. What we're going to do is give you the last uh, last word. If you'd like to say anything to the faithful of TSU. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, we've you know, I, I really speak on, in part to, you know, my parents. I think a, a lot of people don't really understand. Um, uh, you would have to actually be part of the Texas Southern family to know everything that really, all the nuances that goes on within my program because it's a unique situation because, um, you know, not having your own baseball field and so, um, and then also, you know, the facilities and stuff. Most of the, you know, places around the country, uh, two things, you know, you have to know is that uh, the facilities are usually really, really, really good these days. And also you got good coaches everywhere. So uh, I've been fortunate to get a lot of support from uh, just the families of the student athletes that have participated for me. So, you know, all the success and stuff that we've had throughout the years, uh, I want to say that a, a large part of it has been because of the support from not only administrators at, at Texas Southern, but also um, the family, you know, because they've done a lot for us throughout to make this situation work because you know, we do have a lot of adversity and stuff, but I don't choose to talk about it. Uh, we don't make excuses or anything. We just deal with it, and we just only focus on, you know, controlling the controllables and, and that's what we have to work with. So uh, I just want to say that, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, – uh, I'm very excited about this upcoming season, especially um, because of everything that's been going on with the pandemic. And we've been out for probably almost uh, getting close to a year now. I think March 12th was when we stopped, you know, we stopped playing baseball. And so now we're back at it. And everybody's excited. You know, I think – you know, the kids and, you know, my coaching staff understand that we have an opportunity to do something really great. And with everything going on, it's kind of built for a Cinderella story this year, you know, because of all the stop, start, stop, start that we probably know we're going to deal with. And who knows who's going to be the national champion this year in 2021. So I've been telling my kids, you know, why not us? You know, you know, just, hey, let's just keep working, keep working, keep working and believe in what we're doing and let's see what happens. All right, everyone, that is Coach Michael Robinson of the number four ranked Texas Southern Tigers. Coach, thank you for your time. Ryan McGinley, thank you for your work in helping us get Coach on. We're going to take us a quick break and then come back and close out with all of our media members. So please hang tight and we'll be back right after this brief message. This is Ryan Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. 
You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSM Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvée. Have you had your Earth Blend coffee today? At Earth Blend Coffee, we take pride in offering you the very best of beans across the world, blended and roasted to perfection giving you superior quality and satisfying and flavorful taste. Experience the world in one cup with Earth Blend Coffee. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc. And, I- and we're back. We're about to uh, close this, this baseball game out here. We've gone extra innings. Thank you guys for tuning in with us in our first uh, Black College Baseball Media Roundup. Uh, before before we close it out, Mike, Michael Coker, uh, you, had, you had something you wanted to share with the, uh, with the audience? Yes. Uh, th- this morning I received a phone call. It was kind of disturbing to me, but I understood the phone call. Uh, I didn't agree with the coach. And, and from the conference he was from and what he had to say. But I want to say this, in, in, in defense of our uh, voting, our polling committee, our polling committee is made up of an informed and impartial group of individuals who follow college baseball on all levels, mainly historically back colleges and universities who we affectionately call HBCUs. Included in our group are college athletes, administrators, educators, college baseball writers, and other sports journalists and broadcasters, and which includes a, the new media uh, group, uh, HBCU Pro Sports Media Association. When we vote in our poll, we are independent of everybody. We don't rely on one person, and we do not get together and decide on who's going to be n- number one or who's going to make our elites. Black College Nines, we lean towards stats. We lean towards because stats don't lie. When we send it out to our polling guys, for everybody to the many to 40 plus poll voters for HBCU baseball from Black College Nines, before they vote, we compile so much information so that a sound decision is made. And that happens preseason and regular season leading up to our national champion. Um, I received heavy criticism this morning. I think it was unjust. I accepted it. But I wanted our, the nation to know that we have a committee. When we started this endeavor six, seven years ago, it was just six of us. After that first year of our polling, it was the owner the founder of uh, Black College Nines, Jay Soko, has said, we need to be more transparent. We need to get accountability and respectability. We need this to grow. Since then, going from six to where we are now, we will continue to push HBCU baseball. And when we vote and when we c- compile our top 10 polls, when we compile our uh, elite team members, that it is not done by one member. It is not done by two. It is done by a host. I, when I do voting, I like to be the last guy because I want to be the tiebreaker just in case. And we've only gone through that in the seven years we've done this twice. And that's that's kudos to 
what Black College Nines is trying to do and the transparency we put out there because HBCU baseball has a rich tradition stating back to the early 1800s when we first fielded a team at historically Black colleges and universities, which has led us to being drafted by Major League Baseball and where we currently are now. So our respect is the respect that we're putting out there because of, not because of Black college baseball, not because of uh, HBCU, not because of the many things that HBCU offers, is because of the head coaches, what they put on the product on the field, we report it. Thank you, Mike, for that, uh, that, that commentary. Now, what, what I'm gonna ask everyone to do, uh, 30 seconds or less, uh, gentlemen, if you would give me your one greatest take from today's media session. And we'll start off with, uh, let's start off with Carlos. He hasn't had a whole lot of camera time, so we'll let him go first. Carlos Brown of the Carlos thank, Brown Show. Thank you, uh, AD. Uh, it, it's, I sense a lot of excitement by the coaches. We know that uh, they are dealing with the pandemic. That's a given. But I think to keep this season in perspective, I believe the team that has the most talent may not necessarily win it. It may be the team that's able to handle adversity. Let's think about that. That may be the team who wins it all, but the excitement is still there. Um, the coaches talked about their culture and, and, and playing to that culture. So I, I look forward to an exciting uh, 2021 uh, baseball season for all of those uh, that are involved in putting out a product on, on the field. All right. Chivalry is not all the way dead. We, I would have started off with uh, Keisha <laughs> she had her camera on, but since she had her camera on, I'm going to let her go uh, next. Ke uh, Keisha Kelly of Black College Experience. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Kelly. It, it's okay. You let my Jaguar go first. It's okay. I see how this is going, Drew. I see how it's going. It's totally, it's totally fine. But no, I, I do this. I really have appreciate this. This has been really, really, really refreshing to learn a lot of things. And I, I guess I kind of agree with him. But I guess it's more so one of the takeaways for me is seeing how everybody is adapting to or basically doing what they can with what they have, trying to adapt to, you know, everything that's going on with COVID, still trying to recruit, still having to deal with the baseball season, still having to deal with everything that's going on. So I guess my takeaway is how everybody's actually dealing with it still moving forward with and how everybody's still ranked and everybody's still how they're going to actually move forward from this situation. And as they say, making lemonade out of lemons. All right. Uh, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill inside the uh, HBCU Sports Lab. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, and just in terms of a closing statement and a monologue, um, just wanted to take a quick minute uh, out of a book that I wrote to give you some framework on the historical nature. Hey, Doc, Dr. Cavill, I'm sorry. Let me stop you for a minute here. Hold on, because we have some stuff that we have planned. Drew, go ahead and do your closeout, your last moment. Doc is going to have the last word for what we're doing here today. Okay, well, let me, let me keep going around the horn then. Uh, Michael Coker, are you still there? Uh, your, one, your one quick uh, take for today, Michael, uh, that you want to give everybody. Learning experience. Taught me a lot. Taught me a lot about our coaches. Taught me a lot about the people that are around. I love writing. This is a new learning experience for me. It's showing me how HBCU has, has really grown itself and expanded itself, especially baseball, and how I'm going to be pushing for the next 20 years. All right. The one take that I have for today is, and I didn't realize this till I actually looked back at the top 10 the last time I read this, but it's ironic that our three schools from the BIAC that are in the top 10 will not be in the BIAC next year. I did not realize it until I looked back and read it that last time, that being number eight, Central program discontinued. Number seven, Florida A and M, move it over to the SWAC. Number three, A and T, 
moving to the Big South. That is the one thing that I want to bring out in a year of change, in a year of things going on. This is the last time we will do a media day like this with these teams in these positions. Next time we come together, things will have shifted throughout black college baseball. What I'm going to do before uh, I'm going to let Dr. Kavir have the final word. I want everybody quickly give you, give like your 15 second elevator speech tip. Tell who you are and your organization that you are here representing. So uh, we'll start off with uh, Ms. Kelly this time and how, and how they can find you on social, your website, all that good stuff. All right, so I'm, I'm Keisha J. Kelly. I am CEO and founder of Black College Experience. Um, you can find me on Twitter, we're Black College EXP. On Instagram, it's Black College Experience. On Facebook, it's The Black College Experience. And then our website is www.blackcollegeexperienceinc.com. Carlos? The Coles Brown Show. Of course, I'm Coles Brown. The Coles Brown Show, uh, Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 12 noon Central Standard Time on the Open Mic uh, Broadcast Network. We're across all social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all over. Appreciate the time, uh, fellas. Uh, Michael, uh, Black College Nines, go ahead. Michael, lead writer, reporter for Black College Nines. You can reach me at uh, Michael at BlackCollegeNines.com on Twitter at uh, HBCU. I'm sorry, at uh, uh, Black College Nines. I am. My name is also on my Also, I might add, I'm sorry, HBCU Sports Media Association. Pro Sports Media. Pro uh, Sports myself, Media. Michael, Carlos, and Dr. Cavill are members of HBCU Pro Sports Media. I know uh, Ms. Kelly, I'm pretty sure, is going to be joining us in the association real soon. Uh, looking for her to be one of the first uh, females to uh, break break in. Now, we, we're not sexist. It's just, it, it's just how things were at the beginning. We hadn't forgotten about you. We knew you were out there. So, But myself, uh, my name is A.D. Drew. I represent the Black College Sports Network. You catch myself along with my partner, Brian Fulford, on our podcast, the BCS in Sports Wrap. Just had a show dropped this morning before we uh, came on here. And we drop our shows about once a week. You can find us online, www.mybcsn.net. You can find us on social media at mybcsn at the number one. That's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Is part of the Jericho Broadcast Networks family of networks as my JBN online on YouTube. And now what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to say the dean, the doctor, the professor for last. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, sign off and I'm going to let Dr. Cavill do, do what he needs to do, let our producer Roy come in with anything and then ask Dr. Cavill to go ahead and take us to the house. Thank you, Whit. That, I'm Dr. Cavill with Inside the HBCU Sports Lab. I'm glad to join this momentous moment where we were able to give those listeners and those followers out there information about HBCU baseball, particularly coming to you from Black College Nines. With this, I wanted to take this time to do a little historical uh, framework of where we've come and where we're going and just why this is so important. You can follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, at Inside the HBCU Sports Lab better known to many as HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop every Tuesday right here on BCSN, my BCN, BSN, my BCSN.net website. You can follow me on Facebook at Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, that's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L, that's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. With that, Black College football began in 1892, on December 27, with a game between Biller College, now Johnson C. Smith University, and HBCU in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Livingston College at HBCU in Salisbury, North Carolina. In that historic matchup, Biller defeated Livingston. While football has become ultra popular over the years in the African American community and across the country for that matter, it was not the first sport played between two HBCUs. Two years before, in 1890, the first recorded baseball game 
was played between Morehouse College and Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta University, HBCUs in Atlanta, Georgia. To officially form the first black college baseball association when they joined with the two colleges of Clark College, now Clark Atlanta University and Morris Brown College, HBCU in Atlanta, Georgia, from that perspective. A little more on that. As we said, while the popularity of baseball as a national pastime has waned in the African-American community during the 1990s, it was extremely popular among HBCUs during the late 1800s as baseball programs began to expand across the HBCU landscape. During the early segregated days of the formation of conferences housing HBCU athletic teams and programs, talented baseball players of the conferences housing HBCU baseball programs, such as the CIAA, played in professional Eastern Color Leagues, while players of the SWAC and Midwestern Athletic Association, MWAA, played in the Negro National Leagues while still in college. A common occurrence in various sports of the day. Many participated with professional sporting black franchises such as baseball, the Kansas City Monarchs, with Andrew Lewis, Lefty Cooper, who also played at Paul Quinn College at HBCU formerly in Waco, Texas, now in Dallas, the Homestead Grays and Chicago American Giants with Davis, David Julius Malico, or who also played at New Orleans University, now D Dillard University, and HBCU in New Orleans, Louisiana. With that said, I just wanted to give you an update in terms of a history of what it means when we call it, cover HBCUs and Black College Baseball. It's talking about the specific nature of HBCUs, what they have done in the past and what they continue to do now, and certainly what they will do in the future. As we like to say in the particular book that I came this out, that I read this out of, the athletic experience at a historically black college and universities, past, present, and persistence. With that, I thank you and I hope you enjoyed the show. Really wanted to thank you for your time and those that brought it to you, AD, Michael Coker, um, along with our media guest, Carlos Brown, Keisha Kelly, open mic, Dr. Prince, in terms of what he does as well. And finally, wanted to say, as I push it to our producer, Roy Evans with his excellent idea of bringing it to the people. Really hope you enjoyed this moment and we thank you for your time. Network and 